What's up guys Chaos Shinobi here. This is what if Naruto has Rinnegan and Makuten movie. Summary, after being beaten by Sasuke at the Valley of the End, Naruto realizes his worth, deciding to throw away his useless allies, and become powerful. Sharingan Naruto. Rinnegan Naruto. Makuten Naruto. Eight Gates Naruto. Chapter 1, The Kemi and Yami no Shinobi. After the battle at the Valley of the End. A blonde boy laid, silent and unmoving in a bed. He could move. He just chose not to, too tired and too sick and done with all the bullshit. Sasuke has beaten him, like he always did. And he hated it. He wanted Sasuke back so bad because, no reason really. Not because he was their rival or because they liked each other. Because their fights were fun and their conflict important. It was for no reason. He hated him, didn't he? Always did, since Academy, sneers and superiority. Because he was an Uchiha obviously, ha. That is why he hated Naruto. Because he was born to a big family in a big house and a large world and so many to love him, and Naruto was just so different. Sasuke even hated him after he lost everything, no family and no love, and only loneliness, Hal Naruto could say in that way they were alike, but the hate was mutual. Sasuke lorded over him, his strength in the academy by simply leaving without looking back after a duel, by dismissing the fangirls he loved so much. He was obsessed with Naruto. The boy, blonde hair is a duft found himself smiling. Then his sensei entered. His face even obscured looked grim. Naruto, are you okay? Packet bastard. Naruto barked, his blue eyes narrowing in anger at his teacher. Kakashi looked surprised, couldn't even understand what was happening. You did this, Naruto said, pointing to the barely healing wound on his chest. You taught Sasuke, the traitor, how to use the jutsu that caused this wound. You taught him a fucking assassination technique and he used it on a damned friend. This is what not training me gave you, a big red metal stabbed into me. The boy was furious, but Kakashi didn't look like he was going to fight back, just looked remiss and damaged, near dead not in body but mind. What was it, you hated me? You wanted me dead? You wanted me to get killed by that piece of shit Uchiha so you didn't have to deal with me. Then Kakashi, on the verge of breaking slammed his fist into the wall. No, I never knew I want you to be safe Naruto, I couldn't ever I made a mistake and I am sorry but, but what? You should have given me the technique, made Sasuke forfeit, and I would have beaten Garaa, like I did anyway. And Sasuke would be here, and you would be an actual good sensei. But you never were, and never could be. I just don't want to see you hurt. Naruto scoffed. Yeah right, you're just like everyone else, driving me away from kids and looking at me scared. You just didn't want me to explode, I see it in your eyes, the only thing you see is something with nine damn tails. I see your father damn you. Silence fell. For seconds. Then a small voice picked up. My father? You knew my father? And you never told me? Or took care of me? I couldn't, I was a kid and... Bullshit. Who were they? Kakashi stayed silent, hand covering his head, him wanting nothing to escape from that room. Tell me. He body flickered out of the room, vanishing. And Naruto just sat there, anger and rage pouring out of every part of his body. Naruto, what happened? Sakura was standing in the frame of the door, having came in after Kakashi. Only seeing an enraged Naruto and a broken wall. Shut up, Naruto commanded. He always thought he liked Sakura, but didn't she always ignore him? All he wanted was a single date, but he was too unwashed, or uncourteous, or mean or egocentric or anything. She berated him so much, and complimented Sasuke no matter what. Oh Sasuke you are so cute oh Sasuke you are so kind. Bullshit like that, he couldn't fucking handle. Why wasn't that him, why wasn't he adored? What? Naruto I know you just got out of something serious but don't you think that is a little rude? And that other thing, her desire to always be right, to always want to be a perfect fucking princess. It is why she wants Sasuke, why she hates him. And she does, doesn't she? He promised he would bring her boy back, and he couldn't. Honestly, he wouldn't blame her for thinking he did it on purpose, he should have. But why would he even want her? He wanted love yes, a girl, attractive one. But Sakura was mean, was obsessed. He didn't want that. Hell, he hated this whole fucking village. Just leave me alone. Sakura stared at him, anger evident, until she in a huff walked away. She clearly wanted to say something, but didn't care enough. Naruto just sat there, angry. All his life he had been feared by the villagers, shinobi and civilian alike, because the fourth Hokage had chosen to seal it in him. And he wondered how his life would have been without it. But who cares? It could have been some other kid, yes, but then he would have been Naruto Uzumaki, right? An orphan name given to honor the lost Uzumaki clan, and a pointless descriptor of maelstroms. His name meant nothing. No history, he was blonde so he couldn't even pretend to be an Uzumaki, 
But he was. He was Naruto Uzumaki, and that was what mattered. Not the villagers, not Kakashi, not Sakura, not Sasuke, him. He wanted to do something, he did it. He was in the hospital but how many were too because of what Sasuke did? Choji, Neji, Kiba, all fought nearly to their last. For one fucking prick. No, he wouldn't let that happen. He would become strong, so strong he could kill Sasuke, stop them from ever feeling that pain again. And if anyone tried to stop him, tried to halt him? He would kill them. He had to. He was a ninja, he said his goodbyes to his fellow ninja, and then left, satisfied. He wanted to get stronger, strong enough to put Kakashi in the dirt, to spit in the face of people scared of him. No, he wanted them to fear him, not the beat inside. Jiraiya taught him how to use it, but he didn't need it. It made him weak, made him rely on it, he thought, push up after push up. He always stayed fit, but he didn't do it right. He didn't have a teacher to show him how to fight, but he remembered how he did against Sasuke, and so he started his own style. No mercy. Each blow would break bone or organ, even if it needed to sacrifice his own body. He kicked trees over and over again, shattered his knuckles on stone, but they healed back soon. He practiced Rasengan after Rasengan, until his palms bled and the area looked like a minefield after a stampede. He spawned clone after clone, learning how their attacks worked. The best teacher is yourself, he reckoned. So he taught himself, copied his own moves they would use, went through katas with them, fought them. And what he realized, in his last moments before passing out, that they learned too, and that learning returned to me. Jiraiya came for him, but he just stood there. Watched. Naruto didn't care. Eventually he pointed out things, got more involved, gave him jutsus and added moves to his repertoire, and he eventually said, Kid, you level of progress. It is fucking scary. Naruto would have smiled to that had it been over a week ago. Now he just felt fucking empty. A boy, blonde hair and easy identifier, marched out of a shop, new clothes in hand and on person. He had made some money from missions and decided to get new clothes. Some were jackets, black and navy blue, some were combat pants, and shoes and shirts and everything. He wanted to change. He threw his old jumpsuits out. It just didn't feel right. And then a person came from behind him. He turned. Launching the clothes in his hand into the air and spawning a clone to snatch them out the sky. It was Eno, and she looked startled. Oh Naruto, sorry I startled you. How have you been since the mission? None of us have seen you since. Naruto felt like simply walking away, felt like never seeing anyone again, but thought better of it. He put on his old fake smile and did his old fake head scratch, and then stopped. It felt wrong. How are they? Are they safe? Eno looked at him, critical. She could tell something was wrong different. Alive. Choji is still in surgery. I should have been there with them. Tell them I'm sorry. Her eyes widened at that. Oh, uh, what for? For not killing Sasuke when I had the chance. The Hibadi flickered away. And Ino felt weird. She didn't know what to think of this new Naruto. Jiraiya gave his student a letter. He found the kid's development a bit scary. Day by day he was looking more and more like the third. Older maybe but he was also beginning to look like Orochimaru. The letter was from Tsunade. It was a letter made to discuss where Team 7 would be going. Naruto had to attend. The boy got up and left, for his meeting with his team, he thought, for the last time. Hate burns deep. Naruto, new jacket and clothes and demeanor and mood walked in. He didn't have his usual cheery smile, or his usual determination, or his usual fervor. And Tsunade could tell. But she was Hokage. She could ask him what happened later, she wasn't stupid. She knew from what Jiraiya has said in her own smarts that this was because of Sasuke, but she didn't know what it was exactly. She scanned her eyes at Kakashi and Sakura, yet both looked apprehensive. They were, what? Afraid? Welcome Naruto. Now that you are here, we can start this meeting. We will here, discuss wherever Team 7 should be disbanded. It should. And that was a surprise, Tsunade noted. That Naruto, that unstoppable, unquestioning stubborn brat said he didn't want to be part of the team he would have died for? Sasuke really must have changed him. But Naruto didn't care. Not anymore. He didn't care how people saw him, how people acted towards him, their thoughts or observations or perceptions, or fear. He knew they wouldn't change, not now not ever. Mothers would steer their children away from him, Ninja would think of him as an unstable wreck. But what if he became Hokage? He wasn't that well read, but he had smarts, he knew that. And he heard what Jiraiya and other ninjas thought of the fifth before she was crowned. A gambler, a fraud, a coward, a traitor. She left her village in the middle of a war when it lost people. She should have been hated for the rest of her existence, but she got the hat, 
and so everyone loved her. He needed that, he needed to change things. He needed for people to have their perception of him stripped away, for that had to be his. And the first step to that was leaving his team. Naruto Sakura began, before Tsunade's hand came up, silencing her. Let him speak before you interrupt. Naruto composed himself, a small amount of vindication rising inside himself. Two reasons really. Sasuke is gone, and I don't want Kakashi to be my sensei. Elaborate. Ah, uh, well Sasuke isn't going to come back, duh, and I don't think there is any reason to continue without him. And, Kakashi taught Sasuke, a traitor, that lightning arm thing. I don't think I can be on the same team as a guy like that. He kept his parentage in his back pocket. Part of him was scared of who they were. Because why wouldn't the third tell him? They were killers, or traitors, and that is why the fourth got to use him. Because he was worthless, because of his birth. And then he became less that worthless. That was why Kakashi didn't want to teach him, because he saw his traitor father in his place and obviously teaching a child like that a single technique was going to end in failure. And he could handle it, because he whole life he had seen people look through him, see people where there aren't people, see the fox where a boy stood. Kakashi was just another fool. Hmm. Kakashi, would you like to counter any points Naruto brought up? Tsunade asked, her pose open and measuring. Kakashi, Naruto noted, looked like he didn't want to speak. Didn't want to exist. But he forced something out of himself. Sasuke. He was going to die fighting Garaa. And back when we didn't know the exams were a battle, when we thought it was just a contest, we needed Sasuke to win. I needed to. And. I didn't trust myself to teach Naruto. So I guess he is right, I guess we should disband. He said this lethargic, emotionless, energy gone. He felt dead, and Naruto had been the one stabbed through the heart. Sakura, do you have anything to add? She looked on the verge of tears. She charged out the room without another word. Good riddance. Naruto thought to himself, well, this team is a disaster then. Tsunade proclaimed unimpressed, I am disbanding it right now. I would add Naruto and Sakura to other Genon groups, but Sakura is going to be my apprentice soon enough, given her promise in medical jutsus, and according to our resident spymaster, Naruto is fit to be Chunin. The blonde boy's eyes widened, and he smiled wide, because he was one step closer to becoming Hokage. He bounced over to Tsunade hugging her close whilst she sighed, all right. Let go of me brat. There we go. Well, then we have to talk about whatever thing is going on between you and Kakashi. Kakashi looked unsurprised, but Naruto was off guard for a second. She must have been told then, he figured. That or deduced something somehow. Kakashi sighed, then began. I'll start. Naruto, your father was my sensei. He was also, the fourth Hokage. Naruto's stomach plummeted. He felt the emptiness of before coil and turn into something darker. His father? His own father made him a living human sacrifice? I should have told you before, I should have helped you, but I was weak, I joined Anbu and spent the best years of my life trying to kill myself. I was only 14, and we should have been brothers but, then why? Why couldn't you at least train me? Kakashi stared for a long time, before opening his mouth again. I see your father in place of you, and I see myself. I see this young brat hated by the village. I see him, talented and young, and hard in the right place but vicious and feral. We aren't the same, no, but you are inherently skilled in a lot of ways. I couldn't, I was in him too weak. I can't help but see myself, cold and foolish and terrible, the me that got my team killed. And that hurt, Naruto thought to himself, that Kakashi thought so little of him. That he would get his teammates killed, that he would be so foolish. He sacrificed everything for them, and in the end they were the ones who betrayed him. Kakashi was wrong, so wrong. You think I am like you and my dad? That I would sacrifice my own son or get my teammates killed? I protect my friends, that is what makes me Naruto Uzumaki. Sasuke is more like you damn it, with him betraying his friends and being a prodigy and all. Sasuke isn't a prod. And is that an excuse to not teach me? To ignore me, to treat me like filth and exonerate that Uchiha? Naruto, it wasn't like th. My entire life I have had to deal with this bullshit, and you don't understand any of it. I am glad I am off your team, because look at me now. Chunin. Stronger, smarter, more independent. I am better, simply because I am not under you anymore. And Kakashi stayed silent. Just stood there, unmoving. And Naruto thanked Tsunade, who told him he would get his tuning vest later, tomorrow with a couple others, and asked him if he wanted to talk later, and he declined, and then left. And then Kakashi asked may I rejoin Anbu, Lady Tsunade? The next day, Naruto, Neji, Choji, and Kiba were made tuning. Lee and Tenten were put in for a provisional exam, 
that would see them promoted a few weeks later pending Lee's full recovery. So, the rookie 12 went to get something to eat, an Akimichi-owned restaurant owing to Choji. His family were more than willing to provide the food for everyone to eat, and even though most of the inhabitants weren't, it felt like a family home. Well, if your family were made of the best chefs in the elemental nations. Naruto didn't eat much though. Every day he looked better, stronger. He had even grown a couple inches in what he assumed was a late growth spurt, so now he was a little taller than even Eno. Despite that, his stomach felt full. Or rather, disturbed. Hey, Naruto, are you going to eat that? Choji asked, bandages still wrapped around his body and food stuffed in his mouth. I'm sorry. Sorry I convinced you guys to come to save Sasuke. All of this could have been avoided, you know. Contrary to popular belief, Akimichi weren't fat. They were bulking. Constantly. That is why Choji's grip, even after withering in a hospital for more than a week, was still strong enough to rock Naruto back. Don't worry. You wanted to save your friend. I get that. Naruto sighed though. Tears nearly brimmed in his eyes. Yeah, but he was never really my friend. Just took me a bit to realize that. You guys though. You matter. Choji looked stunned for a moment, and then he smiled. Naruto cleaned his plate after. Then another. The food was really fucking good. He reckoned before the end of the year. He would be stronger than Kakashi. No, he believed it. Strong. Naruto and Kakashi spoke little. Naruto didn't want his help, and Kakashi couldn't offer much more than that. They talked about his mother though. I know. I don't want to bother you, but I need to tell you about your mother. The blonde scoffed. Why? You think I want to know the identity of someone else who sacrificed me, who put this beast inside me? No, your mother wouldn't have wanted that for you. She would have fought your F Minato on that. She was a Jinjuriki herself holder of the nine tails before you. Then Naruto thought to himself, well, it makes sense that there would have been one from before. But wait a second, that means she died when the nine tails got ripped from her, right? How the hell did that even happen? Kakashi stayed silent for a bit, paranoia and anxiety and failure and a little bit of spite rising up. Well? Answer me, grief too. Your birth. The seal weakens during childbirth. We took every precaution, but it still didn't work. And that grief hit Naruto like an explosive note. My birth killed my mother because what then was he a monster he had caused this shit didn't he from the start he actually caused it just by coming into existence his mother could have never given birth to him without the nine tails coming out and killing her but he didn't choose this never chose to be born to have the nine tails sealed into him to have his father choose him they loved you so much naruto even before you were born they what was my mom like kakashi swallowed like you boisterous and cunning and chaotic she had rage too, people called her the red hot abanero because if you called her a tomato she'd beat the shit out of you. And Kakshi didn't say Naruto was like his father, smart and analytical and nice to his friends, and filled with a deep cold rage that liked to dig so deep you didn't even know it was there. He saw Minato kill as his sensei, ever since 6 years old, and he was like a beast unchained. Wait, tomato did my mother have red hair? Yes in fact. She was a real Uzumaki then? Because he was different from the rest of those orphans then because he at least had a mother who loved him, understood him, and he had an entire clan, one of the last. And that dream came crushing down. Most were wiped out at the end of Ozushio. They fought hard, and Konoha came to save them, but they were too late. Most were dead, the rest scattered. Your mother was the only refuge here. Well then I'm alone again. Kakashi body flickered away. Too cowardly, too fearful to deal with the child he had abandoned for years. Naruto just sat there, training field desolate. Then he began to train again. Naruto became less loud. He stopped smiling as much. Maybe someone would have thought this was because he was sadder, despondent but it wasn't that at all. He just stopped caring. The hypocrisy of it all though. He was the son of the most celebrated Hokage ever, yet they feared him. He thought maybe he could yell it out. Point at his father, and say look, that is my dad. He loved me, and you should too. But he knew that was pointless. People didn't change didn't see him for anything else because of context. The facts remained, he is dangerous, isn't he? He can fight one on one with Sasuke Uchiha souped up with some bullshit curse mark, fuck up a tailed beast. Hell, he even beat back Orochimaru's fuck body for whatever that grey haired bastard's name was. So why wouldn't they fear him? Why would telling them, I know I'm the Nine Tails Jinjuriki, I know why you all hate me, and hey, the former leader of this village, who was my dad by the way, sacrificed me, for all of you and I know that too, even change anything. If anything, it would make things worse, Naruto look unstable or dangerous, knowing too damn much. And they didn't matter anyway. 
He wasn't strong enough to be Hokage, so it couldn't. He didn't need support to become that man, he just needed power enough. The first was the strongest, the second was his brother, and even beyond retirement they didn't dare contradict the Kami no Shinobi. The third was his student, and succeeded the first's title, and the fourth had stories telling of his massacres, macabre genocides, squads and armies alike taken out in seconds. Each one after the last, too fucking strong to get told otherwise. Sasuke was stronger than him. That was the truth, ugly and bullshit and stupid. That he could beat him. Naruto hated it, and it drove him closer and closer to his goal. He would surpass Sasuke, he would surpass them all, push past them all into the fucking heavens. Past all of them, but those close to him. He liked the rookie nine, Sans Sakura. They were nice and respected him, but not since the start. He needed to show his strength, his intelligence and drive and skill, but he had changed their minds. He knew that would work for everyone else. It had too, he had spoke to Ino a lot at the nearly bi-weekly meetings the rookie nine had. He liked her, but he questioned wherever it was the hormones thing pervy sage joked about, or if he actually liked her, because she acted a lot like Sakura. And was that good? Was he just chasing a version of her that could be interested in him? She laughed at his jokes though, acted flirtingly, and he didn't know what that meant, just that he liked talking to her, to seeing her smile. He would wait on it he decided. No point over complicating things after all, Sakura though, Naruto liked less and less. It started that day in the hospital but continued more and more. For some reason she wanted to talk to him about the situation, even though Naruto knew it would end in tears. She wanted Sasuke back, she loved him, so how the fuck was she going to forgive Naruto for it? And she had burnt those bridges anyways, too aggressive and too unempathetic, a new word he had learned, and cold hearted. So one day, when he ignored her a little too much, she yelled, I know Sasuke leaving hurt you Naruto. It hurt me too, I get it, but you can't keep ignoring it, ignoring him because you don't want to deal with it. Please, I just want things to go back to the way things were. That did it. The way things were? With you calling me a dumbass, with Sasuke ignoring me, with me pining over you both. You think I want that? No, you wanted all the attention in the world, a dark prince like Sasuke-kun and an annoying obsessed brat, both of them to be yours. You didn't care about either of us just what you could get from us. What the hell are you talking about? I cared about you, you and Sasuke. Sure, I will admit I made some mistakes, but it doesn't matter. I still want to be friends, to repair this okay. Can we try at least? And Naruto, furious, turned, walking away fast. Try all you want now that it doesn't fucking matter. She bit back at him. Yeah, I will try. He turned back, angrier than before somehow. Just like you tried with Sasuke huh? The most ridiculous thing. The worst thing, is somehow you still love him. Love this guy you barely knew, love this person that wants to kill you and everyone here, that would betray us all for a bit of power. Don't speak to me again, Sakura. And then he body flickered away. After that, Sakura stopped trying to talk to him. Naruto flew at Jiraiya with an overhead fist, his arm being flipped around, his body following, swung midair by his sensei's large frame. He spawned a clone though, his doppelganger swinging him around back towards the white haired man but being kicked in the face right when he was about to impact. He exploded into smoke though, substituting with his clone in the last moment, Kunai at Jiraiya's neck. Good job brat. You forgot one thing though. And then a blade came at Naruto's own. I know how to use shadow clones too. Spar over. He might have pretended it was for the kid's benefit, but he was breathing heavily too. Heavier in fact. The training was brutal, he thought, but the kid kept up at every single turn. He was 15 now, shoulders wired with an impressive muscle, arms getting bigger every day. He was taller too, Jiraiya thought he might get taller than even him, but estimated around 190 centimeters to be a rational end point for him. Ha, irrational, he sounded like Orochimaru. It was scary though, how he had trained all day and still had that look in his eyes, unchained and unstoppable, like nothing else. We're done for today, keep on those elemental exercises, and for fuck's sake rest. I know you heal quick, quicker by the day, but your brain won't, and Tsunade will have my head if your brain starts leaking through your nostril. Naruto chuckled at that, though his smirk went thin, and he asked a question. You were my father's sensei, right? Jiraiya raised his eyebrows at that. Why now, after about a year? Oh, and what a year it had been. He had hoped to show Naruto the world, give him some life tips, and visit every brothel he could find, as part of his mission on getting intelligence on Akatsuki. But he thinks it suited Naruto, at least this new Naruto, better to stay here, even if he did hate how people looked at him. Yes, why? And Naruto looked, hard and heavy and with all the perception he could muster. Why weren't you there for me? The white-haired man, looked away, 
whistling to himself, asking the hard questions, aren't we kid? Well, for one, I had no real reason to take care of you. You weren't my kid, and Minato wasn't mine either. The third said he would take care of you, and that was it. That, and. I'm just not a very good parent. The inquisitive look his student had told the large set man to elaborate. I had a kid once. It didn't go well. Civilian mother, didn't want to go away from her family, that kind of thing. I tried to come for birthdays, but it never worked. I still feel guilty to this day. If I took care of you, well back then I wasn't going to try my luck against a man who had raised three kids, and an entire village himself. I just didn't know Sarutobi would treat you like an orphan. Wait, so he could have adopted me? Made the most sense too. You're the Jinjuriki, you need to be loyal, strong, smart, get taught the laws of the village. Having a Hokage as Daazakara would do that for you. I think he had something against you. Not enough to make him hate you, but enough to make him not be able to raise you. Like his wife dying the day I was born? Uzumaki asked, anger in his eyes. Ahem, something like that. I am sorry. For what? Jirai laughed. I don't know. Everything. This whole fucking shit show. I am the origin of your name, you know? Minato named you after a character in a dumb book I wrote. All of my students are dead, Naruto. Make sure you die after me this time. Naruto headed home, stripped of his training clothing, and put on a set of more casual clothes, black jacket and orange shirt included. He could still fight in this pair, he could with all of his clothes, but he didn't want to soak these with sweat. Soon, he stalked into a restaurant, Henge in use. Most of the ninjas could spot him, he made sure it was weak enough even sensing him dispelled it, but the civilians, those who worked as waiters for example, just look at him like a normal brown haired boy. It was refreshing, normal but weird. It was a fix, but he wanted respect, not normality. He ordered a dish. He liked a chirakus, a lot really but even he liked variation, and as much he really appreciated the old man and his daughter for being nice to him, he did scare away some of the customers, and sometimes the pity grated on him. It came, steak, seasoned to perfection, northern recipe, probably originating from somewhere like Iwa. He had, regrettably, been studying. But he told himself if he wanted to be Hokage, he would have to be learned, smart. He couldn't go through life knowing nothing after all. And then he overheard a conversation, to Kunoichi, using an anti eavesdropping jutsu, but it was easy enough for him to navigate his way through, opening a pathway, unscrambling their words, allowing him to understand. Did you hear about that Haruno Sakura? The Hokage's apprentice? Yes, her. Exciting news. Naruto himself didn't find it that exciting. He didn't hate Sakura not anymore, had no reason to, but the wound still stung, even if it had healed. She chose to love a traitor, and yet she gets taught by the Hokage herself? It didn't make sense to him, a liability, though maybe that was just his spite talking. Hmm, why is that? Well, every Hokage, except the fourth, had been taught and tutored by the previous Hokage personally. It follows the next one after, would be their student, and so, we would get a Haruno, a non-clan family, as Hokage, and Naruto stopped listening. His eyes glazed over, he couldn't see anything in front of him. Sound seemed to be blanketed, halted by a sharp ringing. His face got hot, it felt like a thousand newtons of force was pushing into his skull from all sides. He rushed out the restaurant, needing air. Air. He just needed to breath. To breath. Sakura, as Hokage? No fucking way. Not under his watch. But what did he have? Strength, something Sakura, any other ninja could have? Charisma? Didn't mean shit without support. And Tsunade? She wouldn't support him, no, she would support her student, the one she made into a copy of herself, who she knew could work and make the village better. So how was he meant to be Hokage then, if Sakura and everyone else was in the picture? Hokage, pervy sage, what makes a good Hokage? Jiraiya ignored the frustration building at the continuous use of the, whilst admittedly accurate, embarrassing nickname, because the brat had asked a pretty pertinent question. Well, you have to have smarts. You can't be a ruler without them. She was good at tests at least, never didn't finish in the top three in the academy. And you need people to like you. Tsunade likes you kid, so that's A+, plus, he said, with a grin. But that only made Naruto more uneasy, because she liked Sakura too. But none of that matters if you aren't strong, and if you don't want it. Me and Orochimaru were headers in that race once, and I'm a foolish drunk who pervs more than he spies, and Orochan is one of the most hated men in the elemental nations. We were both so strong it didn't matter. And there it was, the thing that made him better than Sakura, his strength. Day by day the gap was widening, she was getting further and further away. So far Naruto stopped seeing her as weaker, started seeing her as useless. 
He wondered why they were ever on the same team in the first place. Scary thing is, if Orochimaru came back wanting to be Hokage instead, I'm not sure everyone would have said no. Oro is a mean bastard, but the third was too, I have the scars from training to make me remember. The older ninja, and the younger ones who don't remember him could have welcomed him back, and he would have had a civil war for the top instead of an invasion. He didn't though, wanted destruction, not to be Hokage anymore. I guess people change, huh? He would have been welcomed back after his crimes? Forgive and forget. Even the most vicious people will get power if they fit the position. Show strength, unfortunately people tend to bend to you. Have followers, and more still. Eventually it snowballs into owning a nation. At least that's how most of the modern nations were made. So all he would have to do is beat Sakura. Jiraiya poked Naruto, firm, in the chest. Promise me you won't become one of those ninja who uses power to just, take what you want from everyone else. Naruto just looked up at him, blank. Og, whatever, you probably don't get what I'm saying anyway. And in the end Naruto didn't promise anything. Naruto got one of his old ramen pots. The ones he bought in bulk with a large amount of money the third gave him back when he was simply a student rather than a ninja, boiled some water in a pot, prepared to add the water to the noodles, before thinking better of it. Instead, he got some chicken out, breast, slicing the meat into small chunks, adding the water to the pot but then putting the pot ramen, and some other vegetables, into a pan where he fried the chicken too. It wasn't a Kirikas, but it was his own cooking, and that made it taste nearly as good. What made a friend though? He thought to himself, is it being there for you? No. His plants, his apartment, the air was always there for him, but could never comfort him, couldn't mean anything more than appreciation. Someone you have a response to then, a relationship with them, goes both ways and changes on how they perceive you. The cats he met walking around fit the bill, though they tended to shriek and walk away from him, like everyone else. The rookie nine though, they talked to him. They respected him, but were they true friends? Close friends? Haku was, he thought. The kind of person that understood him. That was it then. A true friend is one that understands your soul completely. That can look at you and know what you are, what you represent. And that was what he was missing. Up here. Did he want that? To stand peerless against the world? To have nobody else to fight? Did he want someone good enough to match him? He didn't know yet. All he knew was the chicken tasted good. A knock came at his door. Naruto's ears perked up, confused. Who would come for him at this time? Was it from the Hokage? But when he opened the door it was Eno. She had a smile, closed eyes, like she was struggling with something that should be simple. Hey Naruto. Um, could I come in to speak with you? She shuffled around a bit, awkward. Naruto let her inside, following behind her to his couch. Then they sat, silent, the rising awkwardness almost overwhelming now. Then Eno blurted out, I think I like you, then covering her mouth like she had said something wrong. Naruto felt a warmth in his chest though, a feeling he could only describe as right, and maybe if it was the him of before, who chased his heart no matter what maybe he would have jumped up and down like a fool and hugged her, but he forced himself to think. Did he like Eno? She was a lot like Sakura, nicer, sure, but the problems he had with Sakura weren't just her temper, were they? She was obsessed, vapid, rude, mean, and a lot of these applied to Eno. She liked to dress well, she liked to pine over boys, wasn't too nice to everyone. That didn't mean she was a bad person, no. But was he ready to be in a relationship with someone? I I. I like you too, but as a friend you know. Don't be offended please, but I don't know if I am ready for that kind of thing. She looked at him then, teal eyes looking so vulnerable and sad, looked to the side. She looked like she understood something. Him, maybe. I get it. I'm sorry. Have a nice day Naruto. Then she rushed out the door. Naruto's heart fell. He might have seen her crying. He didn't quite remember. He finished his chicken ramen. It tasted okay, another B rank, Naruto Uzumaki thought, another shitty team who didn't care. They didn't hate him, but it was hard for them to not think of his position as tuning to not be favoritism. He brings back the Hokage, and gets a shiny new promotion. Look at the whiz kid, whoop to fucking do. Forgetting Shikamaru, yes, fucking Shikamaru, got promoted before him. He wasn't strong enough, determined enough, or decisive to be one. But they had made him one anyway. But when are you ever ready? Naruto wondered. The Nara looked more tired as of late even. He doesn't look like the lazy bum from before, but work had run him down. He doesn't slouch because he is bored anymore, he slouches because he is exhausted. In the wake of sounds bullshit a number of missions had to be taken to reduce their influence, and that put a lot of pressure on the newly made Chunin. He could see it in their eyes whenever they met at Choji's to have dinner, but when he looked in the mirror his own eyes looked full of energy. 
of power. His team was rushing through the trees. Demolition detail, routine he guessed now. He was excited the first time he got to set the explosive notes down, but you wait so long for them to go off that you barely hear the thing from having escaped so far. Once again, he and his team set the notes down across the makeshift camp's outskirts, piece by piece, delicate and specific. They didn't need to infiltrate the base, that was the purview of the ever-prestigious Anbu, but they got to layer the outsides. The idea, always, was to blow up several sides at once. Would make the soldiers within think it was an attack on all sides, and then rush out to meet them, letting the Anbu infiltrate, escape with intel, and trap the insides. Most sound bases were tunnels too, so they tended to flow them up, cave them in. Trap anyone inside, create chaos for all those outside. This time though, the Jonin leading us was distracted. Maybe it was his rash on his neck, or the full moon, or he was tired. Or it was the fox child. Either way, he was meant to be keeping watch, and he didn't. A blade cut through his chest in one clean stab, back to front, the Jonin able to see the tip before dying himself. He choked on his own blood, unable to breath with the steel inside his body. He was dead, he realized, before it had actually happened. His eyes closed, dead, body still upright. The rest of them mobilized, Naruto spawning half a dozen clones to protect his other three teammates before charging in. The sound nin ripped the sword out pushing the body into Naruto, who deftly dodged to the side, boots scuffing against the floor. The sword whistled through the air, just about to hit Naruto, but he stepped to the side again, shifting the blade with both his hands, palms on the flat side like how Jiraiya had taught him, wrenching it out of his grip, then running up to his throat with an elbow strike. His mind told him to Rasengan the man, but it would be too loud, his mission would fail, so he took out a kunai, instead, slashing down at the man's legs, dropping him to his knees before turning around him, behind, stabbing the weapon into the back of his neck. Then he was dead. His first kill. He felt a little numb. Like he didn't know what to expect. Like it didn't feel real. He knew why he did this, it was to protect people, but why had he even become a ninja, why did he? Then a clone popped, seven o'clock, there. He threw the kunai, sailing through the air, puncturing the sound nin's lungs from the back, dropping him to the floor, saving his ally. Another sought to take advantage of the situation trying to tackle Naruto from the side, but in his grip was only wood, a log replacement revealing itself just as Naruto came from above, his fist smashing skull into bark, breaking it open in one blow, debris scattering everywhere. He then body flickered to another, a single kick to the leg crushing it from the side, then another side kick to his nose fracturing it, a stomp to his skull finally killing the man in a threefold strike delivered in an instant. Naruto turned to the enemy's former assailant, who was stunned, on the floor, big surprised, almost frightened eyes. This man had never respected Naruto before, but now he did. He saw his strength, his power. He saw his ability. His grasped onto Naruto's outstretched arm, as they both rushed to set the explosive's fuse off, Naruto lighting a small flame to ignite the entire, thing, but seeing the chaos already, his teammates still fighting foes off, he left a clone instead. Follow me. The man did as he said, Naruto summoning yet more clones, the able-bodied doppelgangers slaughtering the enemy, his team linking up with him, then escaping into the night. He came upon another foe, ducking underneath a reverse roundhouse, seeing an opening just on his chest, a swirling blue ball of chakra, ribbons of slicing hurting blades materializing in his hand. He drilled the Rasengan into her with a scream, the ball ripping apart her torso, before taking her in the air, the explosion destroying her completely, her cries of pain followed by a deep powerful bang. He didn't need clones anymore, not after his training. He flickered then slicing through the neck of one, stabbing into the skull of another, then caving in the chest of the final one with a powerful drop kick. He turned then, towards the camp, towards the black sky twinkling with stars. He saw it all. Then he saw fire, as the clone lit the explosives, and a massive explosion shook the forest, leaves bouncing about because of the rapid winds of the detonation. Naruto looked at the explosion this time. It was pretty, after the mission, he could tell they all feared him. But it was him, not the Nine Tails not that beast inside. He was gonna be known as Naruto Uzumaki damn it, even if he had to kill to do it. That was his ninja way. And he was gonna be the Hokage too. Just not the way he thought. Wounding, Naruto, whenever his group of friends went out, would be at one end, and Sakura at another. They wouldn't speak, wouldn't share glances, would stay as far away from each other as possible. Despite that Naruto still heard what she said. Even from a young age he had always had better senses than most perfect vision and good hearing and even a noise poised to smell where people had been. Jiraiya, weirdly smelt better than most, 
especially better than those who came stumbling out of bars or the Red District at night, when Naruto liked to go on walks to clear his mind. He didn't take note on her conversation usually, preferring to actually socialize, to talk to the people that actually bothered with him, that enjoyed his presence, but occasionally she would talk and something important would happen. This time was one of the few where Shikamaru joined Sakura's side of the restaurant they had booked out. Shinobi owned and built to handle multiple squads coming together for parties and meetups. They talked, normal for a while, until Shikamaru poked at her, prodded at her. Are you still hung up on Sasuke? A troublesome guy like that shouldn't matter. He couldn't see his pink-haired former teammate, but he could image the face she was making, imbued with fury and rage. He wanted little to do with her though, so he sat back and let Shikamaru get berated. He doesn't. It isn't like he is overriding my life, ruining me. I am Tsunade's student. I have all my friends around me. I am safe and getting stronger, so clearly, I'm not getting hung up on him. Shikamaru, showing a motivation rare for him, continued his pursuit. You're though, don't pretend we don't know. You haven't pursued anything else but your work, trying to distract you from him, running away from the fact you still know, that you would want him to come back despite that. And so what? He was my friend. Of course I feel bad about it, I want him back, but that's normal. You just want to attack me for ever liking him for being close to him, because you feel betrayed, when I was betrayed the most. I don't see you attacking N. And then she stopped, and looked around. The rest of her friends were looking at her, surprised yes, but slowly her eyes were drawn to the Uzumaki, an unimpressed look, boring blue eyes, half-lighted staring straight at her. Sorry for the disruption, everyone, she said to the room, then walked out the door. Ino followed after her, and Naruto knew she would never get over Sasuke, that he would always be a part of her. That it didn't matter how strong she got, she would always be his, if she became. In that insane universe where she got to be Hokage, what guarantee would Naruto have that Sasuke wouldn't come back, and she wouldn't give him everything? That she wouldn't hand his head on a platter to the Uchiha Lord, loved by all and celebrated despite his actions, despite his crimes? What would Sakura being Hokage end with, except death, Naruto had managed to do it yet again. Yet he was still apprehensive exploring the sewers of his mind, cracked pipes and horrid smell and dripping water the only sound aside from a low breathing. He followed it, further and further in, seeming to walk miles, hours, until he was in front of the cage itself. And two deep red eyes stared back, unblinking. Furious. Why are you so angry, QBI? It huffed, the power so much it blew up Naruto's jacket by a bit. What is it to you, human? You think you can talk me down like you did the Tanuki child? You failed with your brother, the Uchiha. You have no chance of succeeding with me. That burned Naruto. If he was a year younger maybe he would have yelled, screamed. But now he was just filled with a cold, seething anger. You are weaker now than before, Fox. Oh? You claim to know of my strength, scum? Then the beast rose, the darkened figure in the black of its cell rising and rising until the only thing that could be saw was a huge mountain of shadow, towering above, its paws the only evidence it hadn't transformed. Naruto wasn't impressed though. Because he remembered it being bigger. You are weaker than before. You preyed on my insecurities my faults, but I confronted them, defeated them, and bit by bit you have been starving, because I haven't been feeding you. And then it fell silent, and slammed itself into the bars of its prison, the fox orange and deranged forced grin slamming through as the gat shuddered, water splashed and sloshed, the walls creaked. You humans always think you are more than you are. Scum. Nothing. Pitiful creations of the earth which serve little purpose. You think you will defeat me. Destroy my immortality. Never. We are eternal and you are temporary, and foolish and idiotic and true evil. You will never beat me." And then the beast stopped, seeming to calm down, and in the end his outburst had done nothing. Naruto turned around, shaking his head. He woke up the next moment, covered in his own sweat. He got up and showered. Only then did his heart, filled with fear and excitation both, calmed, and his smile fell. Bit by bit he was beating the fox, he could feel it. One day, Uzumaki Naruto was walking. It was a bit dark. The sun had set but it wasn't too late, and a thought sprung to his head. He really didn't want Sakura to be Hokage, but the possibility rolled itself around his head and he couldn't dismiss it. He knew she wouldn't do well, she would ruin things, herself even. He knew Sasuke was too dangerous to be let live, that Sakura had always been weak. Yet all she needed was a trump card, and in say five years time she would be ready if she didn't fail. So all he needed, was her guarantee that she wouldn't be Hokage. That she wouldn't steal it from him. Then. He would leave her alone. 100%. She used to live with her parents, Chunin both, war vets but not very accomplished, 
but he heard from others that she lived in her own apartment now, to get away from her parents, and to get closer to her teacher, set up near the north end of the village in the Senju quarters. He simply walked in. He was just going up to meet her, to talk. The corridor was a mint green hue, and his footsteps against it were loud, echoed because he didn't care to silence his footsteps. Then she walked out, spotting him, surprise filling her green eyes. Naruto? He tried to regain his composure. Sorry for missing your 15th birthday. That isn't the only reason you're here, surely. He had a grim kind of smile. No. I. Well? He coughed. I have heard that people that you have a chance to become Hokage. And I want you to tell me you won't, that all you want to be is a great Kunoichi, a great medic. Sakura squinted her eyes at Naruto, and he couldn't decipher what she wanted. If what she felt was fear, or confusion or offense. So you are scared that you won't get to be Hokage because what? I am Tsunade's student? Shizun must be next on your list then? Don't ridicule me, you know you have at least a chance. I am not being groomed for Hokage. If anyone is, it's you, Naruto. His eye twitched. Just tell me you won't. Now Sakura looked angry, unambiguously. She was pissed. Won't what? Pursue a life where I'll be the most respected and loved Kunoichi. No, person in the village? Become the best ninja I can be? If I get picked as Hokage, it is because I am the best candidate and you aren't. You're a brat, an idiot, you always have been. You let Sasuke get away, you let. And then Sakura didn't get to finish, as Naruto had sunk a kunai into her stomach. She looked up at him, and she saw pure rage, wounded. And standing there, kunai and gut, another teammate betraying her, Sakura could only wonder why. Naruto regretted it soon after he did it, but this was the only way, right? She was going to take it from him what he was always meant to have. And she would ruin things, ruin it all. And Sakura, like with Sasuke, only regretted what had happened, regretted not seeing what was happening with Sasuke, not stopping him. And regretted saying what she just did to Naruto. She didn't want to be Hokage. She wanted to settle down with a good-looking husband and have a great career as a strong Kunoichi like Tsunade, wanted to make people's lives better, not command people and lead them force them to go and fight in her name. Naruto didn't know what he would have done in those next few moments, wherever he would have apologized and tried to help, or continue attacking her, but he couldn't because his arm simply wouldn't move. Naruto, what the hell are you doing? The furious voice of Shikamaru rung out, confusion and anger evident in his yell. He had always questioned why these two couldn't get together, and now things were even worse. Let me go Shika. Let me go and I won't have to kill her. The shadow under him kept strong though. What the fuck is wrong with you? First Sasuke, now you. I thought you were. And then Naruto, driven by fury broke free, turning towards his fellow leaf ninja in anger, not noticing Sakura beginning to reel her fist back. It slammed into his left cheek with a resounding thud, the force so strong Naruto was propelled by his head through the air, through one of the apartment walls in fact, the cracking of concrete and explosion from his impact reverberating against Sakura's eardrums even when the dust obscured his form. Then she looked down, and saw her arm red bleeding from the chakra she had put into it. She wasn't ready yet, it seemed. Tsunade's technique was still out of her reach. You alright? That's a lot of blood. Sakura didn't hesitate to use her healing palm, biting back gasps of pain to repair the cuts on her arm. She responded to him, adrenaline running through her system, filling her with energy despite the kunai in her stomach. We need to chase after him, we need to stop him Shika. You need to get to a hospital idiot. Let him run away. Don't let him have killed you because you neglected yourself. And his eyes were so angry, almost as angry as hers, but she could tell he didn't want to lose another friend. So she nodded, and he helped her limp away to get help, and alert someone. Someone strong, Shikamaru thought. Naruto was panicking. He was thinking, half a million possibilities running through his mind, thinking how the hell he was going to escape. Another half a million were doubting himself. They wouldn't understand, they couldn't. He did what was necessary, of course he did but they wouldn't have seen it that way. How much he needed, to protect them. From her. Incompetency, foolishness, desire. Everything he hated about her would ruin people. That was what he told himself, what he needed to tell himself. He could go back and kill her, but then their pursuit would be closer and more imbued with fervor. He didn't want her really, he had lost his composure. Made a damned mistake. Did she really have a chance in the first place? Couldn't he have just beat her normally? He was fucked. He had made a mistake and now he was going to be captured, have the nine tails inside him ripped out, and executed. That was if they caught him though. The moment he was out of the rubble he spawned around 100 clones and they dashed away in all directions. Some went nowhere, but most went to the main exits to the village or back to his apartment, where they would expect him to hide away. He himself was going elsewhere, 
to a little exit, must have been old on Boo, that let someone escape the village just by crawling into it, he found it when he was a child and had nothing better to do than dive into every nook and cranny he could find. Must have been hidden by Genjutsu, but it never affected him strong enough because of his fuzzy furred prisoner. He entered it without conflict, nursing the cut on his face from his former teammate, the wound steadily healing with a small wisp of steam emanating from it. It was dark and damp, but he made his way through it fine, turning and twisting through the small concrete walls. Finally, he was out, the refreshing glow of sunlight on his face. Then he had to sidestep, dodging a kunai thrown right at his foot. The perpetrator was an Anbu, but with a blank mask, the only ink on it being knee. He had a burn hair, and looked to be between 16 to 18. Couldn't have been any older, too short and the bare skin on his arms looked too young. If I am correct, you, Uzumaki Naruto, are trying to flee the village. I'll have to ask you to return please. It would do the leaf no good to have an asset like you gone. Naruto didn't answer, didn't care to. He had to escape, just had to, and this guy rubbed him the wrong way. Sure he was a fellow leaf nin, but what if he was like Mizuki? A traitor, and he probably would sell him out, and being on Buu he would have the skills to catch him. He body flickered into the man, a jab at his solar plexus blocked by both arms crossed. Naruto followed up with a flurry of blows hooks left and right blocked each time, but his arms were getting battered bit by bit. Eventually he began weaving in and out the blows, letting his guard rest, yes, but also making his openings more obvious, eventually allowing Naruto to launch a high kick into his ribs, stunning his where a hook could slam into his face, forcing him to stumble away. The Anbu was back right up though, his mask slightly cracked, blood leaking from under it. He zigzagged, dashing left and right like a rabid animal before reaching the Jinjuriki. The boy responded by kicking horizontally across, which his enemy ducked under, grabbing the outstretched limb with one arm, pushing his body down with the other, in a textbook takedown. Both now on the floor, the Anbu tried to follow up by slamming his elbow into Naruto's face, which he dodged by jerking his head to the left, then leveraging his strength, pushed his assailant into a reversal, his own elbow slamming into the Anbu instead. They were hurt, yes, but in that pain they snaked their legs up to the Uzumaki's chest pushing him off and into the air, forcing him to flip mid-air, then greeting him with a few shuriken, Naruto using his clone as a platform to avoid the fan. When he looked back though, the Anbu was gone. Creepy. Then every muscle in his body told him to jump over a swipe, the blade barely passing underneath. He twisted mid-air, unleashing a kick across the Anbu's arm, sending his tondo scattering away, across the dew-blessed grass. He landed, as the auburn-haired adversary rushed into him, an elbow strike across his face turning it to the side with its power, followed by a few punches, none of which landed, then a head kick, feigned into a grapple, the Anbu tossing Naruto through the air, into a tree, then smashing his skull with his knee after body flicking into it. And then Naruto burst into smoke. The real Naruto, having spawned a clone and dodged out the way, grabbed onto the stunned foe's waist, suplexing him from behind into the floor with a resounding strength, forcing the Anbu to roll across the floor, his body skipping once, twice like a rock across a pond. Hard thuds and upturned dust and dirt marking him. He struggled to get up, but he still did, eventually, whilst Naruto studied him. Though he was the optimal distance, the Anbu didn't even think to do hand signs, to cast an offensive jutsu. That didn't make sense to Neruro. He knew why he didn't do it himself, it was too loud. Everyone would figure out where he was but the Anbu hadn't even thought to call for help, didn't want to use jutsus, because he didn't want to be discovered either. Naruto gambled. He rushed towards the Anbu again leaping into the air as both their legs slammed into each other, him flipping overhead after, and releasing an explosive note from his grasp to the side. As if possessed, the Anbu rushed over to turn it off, managing to release the disarming sequence of chakra, but it was too late. The Uzumaki used the distraction to his advantage, palming a kunai and slashing at his enemy's legs, then cutting across his now dropped body, slicing under his ribs and chest, until stabbing at his throat. At the last second though, the man caught the kunai with his hand, the blade running through his fingers, piercing his neck but barely enough to sever it. T traitor. Then something happened. Naruto could feel a pulse of chakra run through his arm, into his brain, and suddenly he was inside his mindscape, with the enemy in front of him. Behind the bars of the QBI's cell, he removed his mask, weird, and opened his mouth to speak. I am Yamanaka Fu, and you have betrayed the village. I want you to know, scum, that we will never stop chasing you. Not until we rip the soul out of you and put your beast inside someone else. You hear me. And then a roar came bellowing out as the QBI clasped his jaws around the Anbu, killing him instantly, the fox chewing and swallowing before proclaiming, 
pitiful as he is, no mere mortal shall be allowed to trespass on my container's mind. Now be gone human. Then the beast retreated to the back of his cell, into the shadows once more. And Naruto awoke to Fu, because that was his name apparently, dead, his eyes distant and far away, his nose running with a waterfall of blood, eyes crying red tears, ears full with a scarlet liquid. It was gruesome. And Naruto felt deserved. He wasted no time sprinting at top speed again. He needed to head west. To Tsuna. Then, he would be safe. Tsunade rushed down, she would have been sprinting if it wouldn't make her look manic, Shizun by her side, hospital quarters seeming a blur as her mind rushed with a million different things. She almost smashed the door open, and she saw Sakura, a medic nincying to her wound. She looked pale, but still conscious, and strong. She pushed the medic nin to the side, who was grateful for the break, letting Tsunade work on Sakura herself. Sakura, you're going to be alright. I know, she said, nearly lethargic but with determination. Who did this to you? She knew of course, but she wanted Sakura to say. Instead though, a voice from behind answered Naruto did it. She turned to look at Shikamaru. Anger, rage was her first thought, but then confusion and analysis. Why the hell would he even think of that? I don't know, but he and Sakura had been fighting a lot. Maybe he just got pissed. Then her eyes opened, realization hitting her like a truck. The nine tails, feeding into his anger. After this long, with the seal weaken, it could have changed his personality. He got corrupted somehow. The wound was repaired. Tsunade walked out. To let Sakura recover. And get a drink. She had lost someone else it seems. Desert winds. Naruto unfurled a makeshift shemog off his head, the sandstorm he had just been engulfed by in the early moments of the morning dissipating and revealing clear blue skies and the endless sands of the desert. Sweat poured down his head, the Uzumaki taking a swig of an empty water skin. It didn't make him less tired but it gave him some comfort as his legs tracked further and further into the land. He had been pursued to and past the borders to River and Suna both. In hindsight, he should have taken more water from those cool streams he dived into to rid himself of his scent, regretted his misfortune in traveling over warm pale gold sand and living under the hateful gaze of the sun. His targets, and he had to kill a few, were Jonin, or Hunter Nin, dangerous and difficult to fight, but when he had his full arsenal, it was easy to dispatch them. He tried not to kill his opponents, but he wasn't sure if everyone survived. Arms and legs aching and burning, even under his tan, he walked on and on, one mind and determination. He needed to get to Suna, needed to see Gara. He didn't know how long his sandals thudded against the ground, his now worn trousers caked with sand, wisps of his cut jacket flowing in the wind, his only comfort the scarf wrapped around his neck, made from a Jonin's own shirt, blue and tight knit. Until he opened his weak, sleep deprived eyes and saw a dot in the distance. One that became a blot. That became a block. That became a building. And then a wall. And then a city. It was huge. He had no other thoughts, as he neared more and more and the brown wall seemed to arch above and above, until it blocked out the sun. It was so much taller than the leaf's wall, built high and high to keep out the sandstorms, the scars of its assault visible on the structure itself. Maybe there were people rushing to him, he wouldn't have known. He was too busy looking at the wall, as his vision darkened and he dropped face first into the floor. He had made it. Suna, Lady Tsunade, surely you can't send our troops into wind country to search for Naruto. Homura, old member of a sort of advisory council to Haruzin and now nothing but an entitled old man told the Hokage, I can do whatever I damn please, you old fool. He is our Jinjiriki, and a possible missing nin. Possible? He attacked one of our Kunoichi your student mind you and several other shinobi after his escape. You can't possibly think he is innocent. Tsunade stayed silent for a moment, then motioned for her assistant Shizun to come to her. Make sure we get a line of correspondence with Suna. They need to tell us if when Naruto gets to them. Make sure they understand our position of power, and how desperately we need him. What if they hide him? The black-haired Kunochi, holding a few scraps of paper asked. Then one of our spies will tell us, and then it will be war. One we'll win, you're awake. A redhead spoke, his burgundy vest long waist reaching fabric stangling past his body. Naruto noted how little his body had changed compared to his, his stature better, his muscles corded and big, giving him a larger frame, and finally his height. As he pulled himself from the bed he had been put in, he began to tower over Garaa. A glass of water floated next to Naruto, the object balanced with an impressive show of control on a platform of sand. He took the cup, drinking in small sips, and then swallowing the thing whole in one big gulp, he still had that same sense of gluttony from when he was younger, maybe learned from his huge appetite he had from a young age. Thanks for that Gara. I'm in Suna right? It has been a while. 
You have changed. A tense silence followed. Did you do it? Do what? Attack your teammate? Blue eyes locked onto turquoise. I I had to Gara. She was going to be Hokage, and I couldn't let her. I needed to be the one. Wasn't she one of your precious people? Ah, that phrase. It had been so long since Team 7, since he had uttered it he felt he could have forgotten it. But flashes of Haku running through his mind told him he never could have. I thought she was, for a while, but I was wrong. It was a mistake though. I should have left her alone, worked to better myself, made links and forged alliances rather than trying to kill her. It was a mistake. Gara made some sort of contemplative grunt, then continued, his choice of action simple. Well, then we will need to lie. Push a narrative that you only defended yourself, that she attacked first, that you needed help so you fled to us. Naruto looked up, his mind racing. You would defend me just like that? You would do the same. Naruto took a hesitant step forward, then hugged the boy, his true friend. But Naruto, I can't protect you forever. I'll teach people to give you lessons on subterfuge, give you an escort, but even if I plead there will come for you and negotiations will break down, and I can't go to war for you when I don't know if I'll win. That makes sense. But what after? I just give up on being Hokage? I give up on that dream? Gara thought himself for a few moments. There hasn't been a Hokage like it in all history, but plenty of Cage have been put in power via coup. All you would need is power, and influence. You have been branded a traitor but if we put that seed of doubt in their mind, the idea that you are innocent, the younger generation, including your friends would be more willing to be on your side. A prosecuted Jinjiriki, attacked and forced to flee coming back and taking the village may be compelling. And Naruto hated it, but he needed to say it, to suggest it. And the son of the fourth Hokage too. What? That makes sense. And it works for us, either way you put it. A successor to him or one who was betrayed and used by him. The two clasped their hands together. In agreement. You know Garaa, you're scarily good at this. He smiled. Naruto walked out, a white face mask covering his whiskers. Garaa made it clear he wasn't to be seen in public to give them as much time as possible inside Tsuna before he was driven off by Kanoha. The sun was above, noon he guessed, the heat and brightness reflecting off his new white garb, soft comfortable silk that twisted in the light breeze. He was out to meet his escort, a Jonin he was told. Hey, Naruto. That you? Asked another blonde her hair done up in bunched up twin tails, a grey garb and large fan on her back. He recognized her from the tuning exams but she was older now, 18 years old he guessed, taller and with a fuller figure. Tamari? I'm guessing you're my escort. She gave off a bright smile, one he liked the look of, genuine and caring, whilst fierce as well. My brother gave me the job of watching over you to make sure you don't get trampled or something. I guess it will give me a break after the constant missions I've been going on. Naruto smiled back. Well? My valiant escort, do you have anywhere in the village you would like to show to a visitor? Tamari smirked, holding her chin in her small hand, looking up and to the left in a kind of concentration. A lot. Let's get some lunch first. Recovery. Naruto tried to summon a toad a few times, but it never worked. He assumed they struck him off the summoning scroll, after Jiraiya told them about him, and he was fine with that. He would miss game Ubuntu, and the strength it gave him, but he was going to have to rely on himself. He was meditating. Sat his legs crossed over each other, the warm winds of midday pouring over his face, not too unpleasant for him to simply breath it in. If he opened his eyes, he would see the bottom of the city walls, the huge drop he would make into the desert sands below, but he didn't. He thought on the nature of the wind, the sand, the sun, how it felt similar, mirrored the nature of the trees and leaves and do drip of fire country. It was peculiar, how something so void of life felt so alive. The dunes shifted like a body of a huge snake slithered through the landscape the wind and ever-flowing breathing of the land itself, the glow of the sun's heat a warm reminder, a grip, too strong but motherly holding onto your face, your back, your everything. It was all connected, he realized. It was all linked to Nardo. I know I told you to relax after training but you've been up here for like an hour. I had to ask Baki where you were even. Naruto was snapped out of his thoughts by his escort, her battle attire from earlier soaked with sweat swapped out for stylish tights and a tunic, black and navy blue, threads of red contrasted. Red like her lips quirked up in a grin. Oh, sorry. I was just appreciating the nature. Naruto spoke, rubbing the back of his head in some sort of embarrassment. She sighed, but smiled through it. Never mind, I was just thinking, what if we went to get some curry? You seemed to like it last time. Naruto spent more and more time with Tamari. It was natural, she was his guard, but there was something else. He looked at her a lot and she looked at him. He though she looked beautiful sometimes, and he would need to look away to hide his blush at that part of his mind. Maybe he had a crush, 
but he didn't want it to be like his time in Konoha. But following after her, watching her stride as she led him by arm through the streets of Suna, he wondered how this place could ever be like Konoha. And he started to think that he liked it. Garaa walked into a dim lit room, asking one of his accompanying men, Suna's equivalent of Anbu charged with protecting the Kaze Kage, to partially raise one of the curtains, taking off his hat and face mask. He liked wearing the adornments around the people. They appreciated the tradition and it obscured his more unpleasant features, his eyes were a part of it but Tamari and Konkuro joked he had a resting bitch face, whatever that meant, but it chafes sometimes, and he took it off, always, in private. He sat at a desk, which was more like a round table. The Kazekage's estate had many such rooms like this, weird and unnecessary, nobody knowing quite how many were made and who made what. Garaa ignored the array thoughts signaling his man to turn the screen on. And through it appeared Tsunade. We are both busy people, Lord Kaze Kage, so I will simply ask what I need to ask. Are you harboring Naruto Uzumaki in your walls? Garaa could lie, could say he had no idea where the boy was, but if a single spy had spotted him, and found out what he kept a secret with hinges and face masks, Tsunade would go to war, announced or not, and he didn't know if he could win that fight. So he told the truth. We are, yes. I ask you return him then. He is our asset, our ninja, and a missing nin at that. Garaa's lip upturned at asset, because was that all Naruto was to these people? A weapon, a tool to be used and discarded? Like he was? I will decline. He is a friend, a good man, and the crimes you have alleged of him, assaulting a teammate for example, are ridiculous. We will protect him as long as these claims remain unproven. And he used her opinion of him, young and inexperienced and a puppet for the elders, emotional and idiotic and squeezed all he could out of it. He told her to convince him Naruto was a villain, prove it, and he would give him to them, and they wouldn't have to war. Very well. We will prove these claims without a shadow of a doubt. We already have witnesses, evidence. And yet you lack a motive. You need his character, and from what I hear about your own adventure that character is impeccable. Tsunade's own face, neutral, gained a determined shadow, reminding Garaa why the woman in front was the Hokage. The face reminiscent of her grandfather flashed on her features, before falling. Don't worry Lord Kaze Kage. We will reconvene soon, she said, her face still determined, a challenging smile on her face. And then her face left the screen. Garaa's stomach fell. He was scared, he realized. Scared of what he had just done, scared if his wager would pay off. Konoha, he knew, couldn't just barge past and invade sooner without a good reason. Naruto hadn't been kidnapped. He simply wanted his crimes to be proven. Suna was supposedly a glorified prison, but Garaa held the key, and when the time came, he would let his friend out. Hey, your curry is getting cold. Naruto was shook out of his thoughts, his past, the leaf, by Tamari's words. He looked at her wide-eyed, before smiling to himself, taking a big spoonful of the sauce. It was delicious, not in the same way Tucci's was, but delicious nonetheless. He liked Suna, a lot more than leaf at least. He was able to walk down the road without people staying away from him, albeit with a mask. He could afford whatever food he wanted, had all the time in the world to train, and he had Tamari by his side. Are you alright Naruto? She asked, her expression remorseful but strangely determined. She knew what kind of things Naruto went through from her brother's tales. The constant fear, the lack of friends, the disdain. It all coalesced into something horrible, and she wanted to at least distract the boy from it, definitely, since I'm with you. He spoke with a devilish grin. Tamari didn't blush though, simply smiling and looking away, before tutting. Flatterer, that's fair. I do enjoy my time with you though. Tamari looked at Naruto from the side of her eye, taking a piece of bread, scooping her sauce with it, and taking a bite, before turning to the Jinjuriki again. Me too. You are an impressive man, Uzumaki. Naruto grinned. So formal, you wound me. Tamari laughed turning back to her meal. Naruto realized he enjoyed his time with her more than anyone else. More than his friends back in Konoha. He missed them, but she made him forget whenever she looked at him with that determined smile or those pretty, dark blue eyes. She was his best friend throughout this entire thing, Gara too preoccupied with work to hang out, though he appreciated it when it happened, but even she couldn't distract him from those thoughts, of what his friends thought of him, Shikamaru and Sakura implanting a worm of traitorous thought into their minds corrupting their idea of him bit by bit. Would Choji, Shino, Neji think he was a worthless traitor? A bastard who had been corrupted by something? It was a mistake, he knew, but it had built up for too long. Since he joined Team 7, since he joined the Academy, since the moment he had took the first step outside the orphanage that feared him so much. Every moment built up to a rebellion, 
and Sakura was the outlet. He can't say he didn't feel foolish, maybe a little guilty, but every time he thought of being Hokage, everything he could ever want, he felt a little stronger, a little more justified in doing it. He needed it, he realized. Him being away from the village intensified that thought, then he needed to be there not just for the power and recognition, but for the control, to turn the leaf into a village that deserves to exist. Should prosper, rather than be destroyed. He was stronger, every day. Garaa, when he had the time, taught him of the desert. How to escape, how to use its winds to your advantage, how to stay hydrated, how to improve your stamina. His control became nearly masterful, his powers increasing as his body did. He had a wind affinity and Tamari taught him so many things about it. Even without a chakra conducting fan he was nearing beating her out, and he was glad she smiled rather than scowled when he improved. He had spent so long without that. You're spacing out again. She spoke, with a pout. Naruto looked at her, a comeback brewing. Sorry, I'm just distracted by your beauty. That one made her blush, even slightly. Naruto counted that as a win. Try that again, and see what happens. She spoke challengingly. I like your eyes. Her cheeks reddened again, and she charged at Naruto, took his head in her hands. Naruto nearly flinched away, but then she kissed him, chased. Naruto was surprised, taken aback, but then he leaned into it. Then they separated, and both were smiling. Exile. That is our ultimatum. By next week, give Naruto Uzumaki to us, or we will have to take him. The Konoha envoy stood up from his chair, and stomped out the room, followed by the nearly unseen Anbu escort. Said escort almost certainly sent to spy out vulnerabilities as well as try to find Naruto. Garao was unimpressed, but he did recognize the threat by what it was. The inevitable coming for him. He'd have to tell Naruto he was due to leave soon, though he was concerned by how his fellow Jinjiriki and his sister had grown close. He knew Naruto would do right by her, he never betrayed a true friend after all, but he didn't want to lose him and Tamari in the same day. The question was, would she leave with him? How much did she love him? Naruto himself was of course accompanied by Tamari, both nestled inside an underground bunker far from prying eyes the moment the envoy had arrived in Suna. It hadn't taken long for their dinners and lunches together to be called dates, for them to be boyfriend and girlfriend, though they hadn't done anything serious yet. Naruto thought he loved her though. She made him happy, happier than anyone else made him, and she was so brilliant too. Smart, determined, loyal. All the aspect he realized he valued in a person. All that which he needed. He wouldn't let Konoha take that away. He would fight, and if he couldn't do that he would run, flee from them to keep Tamari safe and with him. Over the month he stayed in Suna, with Tamari making his spirits stronger, he had become even stronger. He consulted jutsu specialists, learning their elements and techniques with the blessing of Garaa. He tested himself against Genjutsu users, increasing his resilience against them. He even fought against multiple Suna on Buu at the same time to improve his capabilities. But the most important, most powerful thing was a special and familiar technique he found when he was skulking about the old and mostly abandoned underground Suna archives, a green scroll that had the word Ichimon scrawled upon it. The eight gates, the power Lee had used to become a force to be reckoned with against Garaa in the Chunin exams, and he knew them. Well, two of them. He had only had a week and had yet to crack the third, but he already multiplied his combat effectiveness using them. He didn't even feel the metal strain he was supposed to have, and according to some old woman who Garaa got to check on him, there was no brain damage. In fact, she said the chakra pathways were stretching across, energizing the organ and making it stronger. In time, she said he would be able to be better even without using the gates. Naruto thought that was promising. I'm going to meet him again. I'd appreciate it if you gave me some privacy. Tamari looked at him, serious expression on her face, and nodded. She knew when Naruto spoke to the Nine Tails it was safe to avoid him though he had never seen him once lose control. He simply sat, and meditated. Calm. She appreciated Naruto's approach to controlling the Nine Tails, especially considering it was so much stronger than the Tanuki, as impossible as that seemed, but she understood why her brother didn't dare. He had spent so long under its control, he didn't want to lose it again. When Tamari left, Naruto calmed himself and closed his eyes. He thought of the wind outside, the desert dune shifting. He thought of the crashing waves of the shore, of the blowing leaves of home. Fire, and its burning powerful smell, the black and char it left behind. And earth, mud and rocks and stones and mountains, all connected and linked, yet stationary. He opened his eyes. He no longer opened them to a sewer, but a passage, a tunnel of vines of grass and rock, spiraling etches of red and blue chakra leading further and further down. He followed it, a light shining up ahead, until he exited to a large expanse, ground a field of picturesque green grass, 
emerald floor, below a blue sky, and beyond the gates which stretched far above into the infinite above, there was only black. What are you here for, human? He countenance had changed, no longer furious, no longer powerful, but evil and spiteful, and weak. I don't know, to gloat maybe. Here you are, weak and afraid whilst I stand before you, unstoppable. A chuckled came from the cage. Pitiful little human. You do not realize. Yes, you have taken something from me, but only my form, not my power. You notice you do not look into the eyes of a fox anymore, but shadow? That is because that is what I am inside, what I will always be, and now I will forever be unavailable to you. If you were to enter these gates, and do so at your greatest peril, I could just phase through you. You would not even touch me with your filthy hands. I am power incarnate, and you are simply an ego-filled child, one who believes they can conquer me like you conquered your teammate, force alone. That you can use me like you use your friend Garaa. Deluded. Naruto scoffed. I will find a way to control you, I know it. And when that time comes you will cower in front of me, and beg me not to destroy you completely. And, like you did to those villagers so long ago, I will show you no mercy. And that shows how little you know, how tainted with the disease of ignorance you remain. You, with that same ignorance, will never control me. And then Naruto summoned a book to his hand. I read up on you. Tales of the Sage, and yes, that is the Sage. The legendary warrior that jailed the ten tails and turned them into your siblings and you. The fox, now Shadow, growled. I will find out more, and soon, I will have all of your power. I will take it all for myself, and you will cease to exist, and then the nine-tailed beast will not be some mindless fox, it will be Naruto Uzumaki. Well that's it then, Naruto stated, looking solemn, annoyed. He wanted to stay in Suna, because he had grown to love the place. Not as much as he loved the leaf and his fervor was stronger now than it was then, to be the Hokage, but he did like the wind blowing, the sun beaming. He had grown tanner over the past month, spending that much time out in the open sun. Gara looked at him, with the look of a ruler, one who had become one, and was suited to be one from a young age. Will you take Tamari with you? I would think so. She is a Joni Naruto, and my sister. If she insists, I will allow her to escort you, but I cannot let you take her. And Naruto looked betrayed. What? I know you care for her, but unless she decides to leave, become a missing nin herself, I cannot permit her to abandon her post. That's bullshit. You would leave her in the dust just because she came with me? Garaa shook his head, placing a reassuring arm on Naruto's shoulder. I would never, like I would never leave you in the dust, but I cannot sacrifice my entire country for her sake. If the leaf find out I sent a registered Jonin with you, it would mean war. I would die, Konkuro would die, and Tamari would lose everything. I cannot let that happen to her, so either she leaves with you, or stays here. It is her choice. Naruto calmed down, now thinking. He had come far from the boisterous teenager he was before, now considering Garaa's words. Okay. We'll ask what she wants then. Where is she? Garaa sighed. Outside. I called her when I called for you, just a little later. The Kazekage motioned, opening the door with his sand, where Tamari walked in. What is going on here? This isn't the normal kind of meeting. Something has happened. Gara looked at his sister with care and consideration, and answered. The leaf are demanding Naruto back. The first thing I have to ask, is are you willing to leave the village, go missing Nin and escape with him? Tamari's skin looked pale. She stayed silent, shocked, then stepped over to a chair, collapsing into it, covering her head with her hands. Naruto didn't know what to do. He wanted to hug her, comfort her, kiss her, tell her everything would be alright, but he couldn't. He can't make this right just by making her not sad. And Tamari's head was swirling, her mind on the precipice between her family and the new love she found in Naruto. She cared about him, she really did, but how the hell did she console that with leaving Garaa and Konkuro? With having to sacrifice all the support she gave Garaa, the help, the leadership, the making sure everyone respected them. If she went missing Nin she could squander that all. And then her face looked up, tears dripping down her face. Remorse and pain and impending guilt painting it. I I can't. I can't stop being a Jonin, being me, I can't leave my family. Naruto, I'm sorry. And Naruto knew, almost since the question came, what the answer was. He wasn't worth enough, he wasn't enough, he couldn't be enough for her. For anyone. He was worthless. And now he was crying. Tamari tackled him in a hug. I'm so sorry Naruto. I I love you but I can't leave my brothers. I I, I understand Tamari. I love you too, I'll love you, for however long it takes you to come back. I know, after Garaa and Tamari had left, two ninja, Jonin entered. Naruto, I assume. We have been told by Lord Garaa T. Yeah, I know. 
I just have to knock you guys out, right? The larger man nodded. Yes. After you will. Then Naruto moved, body flickering behind him, then smashing his elbow into the back of his skull, dropping him like a fly. The other jumped back, body's reflexes trying to get him away, but too slow, as Naruto blitzed across the room, leaping into the air and smashing his knee into their skull. Both down, Naruto smirked to himself. He worked out his frustration at least. The escape plan had already been made, and he was ready to leave. Leave it all behind, but why did it need to be a bad thing? Sure, he was being pursued, but he didn't need to care. He was free, and strong enough that it didn't matter who they sent after him. The only person that could beat him was Jiraiya, and he knew how to escape even him. Just avoid any toads, send out a fuck ton of clones, and exhaust him. And he was free. From commitments, from loss, form everything. So even though he would miss Tamari, even though he would come back for her one day, he wouldn't let that defeat him. In minutes his sandals, new and Suna made, were skating on sand. He moved through the desert with an insane speed, earned from the weeks of practice, of training. Royal flush. Tsunade was furious, because she had been outplayed. She knew of the Kaze Kage's preference of the boy, and she tolerated his insistence they collect all the evidence together. But Naruto still escaped. She wondered if it had even been organized by Garaa, like she assumed, and even if it wasn't would he have escaped regardless. He was a far cry now from the boisterous boy that had brought her back, now hardened, powerful and smart and a traitor. Just like Orochimaru, like Itachi. He didn't have an excuse like Sasuke did either. He just wanted to kill his teammate. When Sakura came to and told her about Naruto, what he had done, his desire to become Hokage running through her mouth, part of her wanted to deny it, and the other wondered why she hadn't seen it earlier. He had the appearance of Nawaki, the wannabe Hokage, to be something, but he had the ostracization of Orochimaru, feeling betrayed by his village, his sensei his teammates. She always assumed he was like Jiraiya, but that was because she couldn't see the pain he felt underneath. Never could. Shikamaru said Naruto attacked her unprovoked, wanting to kill her, though Tsunade doubted he was eavesdropping like he said he was. It didn't fit. He would either barge in and ignore them or walk away, the situation too bothersome. When Garaa wanted evidence, she had to ask everyone who knew Naruto to testify. It was biased, yes. But there were still a large number who said they couldn't believe Naruto would betray his friend. Shino, Kiba, Choji, Ino, even the shy and quiet Hinata stated it was false. Tsunade guessed Naruto never would have attacked a friend. Just that he thought Sakura wasn't anymore. It had been building up for years, ever since Sasuke left. Team 7 was a disaster, and so was the Leafs' prodigal system. Naruto, their latest. Rumors building over his mission successes and power now tainted with the assumption that everyone with talent in the leaf wanted to leave. Tsunade herself included. What she had to do left the taste of ash on her mouth. The image of Nawaki, Dan, overlaid with Naruto over them, by her hand. But she needed to do this. She needed to stop another monster like that snake from coming to be. Dragon. Sen the hunter Nin, Kakashi Hitake had, from a young age, had the ever important lessons of honor and responsibility drilled into him by his father alongside grueling training sessions of course. He recognized the toddler-sized genius he had in Kakashi, and took to making sure he had a good sense of morality like his father before him. When Sakumo Hatake killed himself, it made Kakashi question everything he had learned. Because Kakashi resented him, resented his father for leaving him, for abandoning that lesson of honor and responsibility. Only one thing made him happy, which was getting better, stronger. It was the only thing from his father that wasn't tainted by hypocrisy, that eternal strength of his. People rumored he could take on all of the Sanin at once and survive, and even beyond the tainting edge of his death that legend stayed. So Kakashi decided to pursue it, become strong and smart and tall and everything. Then Obito came, and Obito died, and Rin died, and Kushina died, and Minato died, and Kakashi decided he didn't care about strength anymore, because even the strongest person you know can die. He took to trying to end his own life, to kill himself on missions one after another because he didn't deserve the bare threads of life he had somehow clung onto after all that loss. And then one day, he realized he was his father. Strong, legend, but a hypocrite. He wanted allies, wanted to protect people, wanted to do well, so why was he on mission after mission trying to end himself? He should be there, he realized. He should be taking care of Naruto. By the time he finally grew up, took to the Jonin roster and begged the Hokage to let him be Naruto's sensei, he had already been away for too long. The little baby toddler that knew him as Inu and reached up to his mask with pudgy arms and innocent eyes when he babysat him, had been replaced by a spunky 12-year-old, 
chaotic and too many problems to even list. He thought to himself, at least the boy was happy. It was his mistake, intentional maybe, that he couldn't recognize the boy's sunny smile to be the same fake one his father used in the last days of his life. Then he changed. He told Kakashi he was a failure. That he had nearly killed Naruto by giving Sasuke the Chidori, may as well have pushed the fist through his chest himself. He needed to give him it, he told himself, needed to make sure Sasuke lived, but he was a traitor, tried to kill his teammate, and left the village for power alone. Naruto told him he didn't want to see him anymore, and Kakashi, ever the coward, ever self-hateful, did so. He still saw him of course, but never face to face, and he looked determined, angry, but full of life. Then he tried to kill Sakura. And he left. And this was no longer his personal problem, this was a case of national security. Naruto was a traitor, not just to the leaf but to his teammate too. He knew Sakura wasn't lying, the Sharingan able to tell from the smallest facial movement, and Naruto claimed he fought in self-defense. Kakashi knew it was false, that his entire life had been a long stream of betrayals. His father, himself, his students. All that was left is to mend his mistakes. To bring Naruto back to heaven, to see his parents again. Kakashi Hitake put on his old Anbu mask, equipped his Tanto, and prepared to head the Hunter Nin squad. They would bring the boy back alive, hopefully, sealing the Nine Tails in a new container. He was one of the candidates. He would accomplish his mission, without fault, because the only thing he had never failed was a mission, pink hair. Sakura had hated it and loved it. Same thing with her chakra. It was easy to manipulate but lacked the power of others. That was until she had been taken under the tutelage of Tsunade. Her combat style bloomed, the power of her punch is incredible. Soon, she had nearly caught up to Naruto, at least she thought, in power. She knew he hated her, he had his faults, but she still cared for him. He was a fool though, she always knew. Instead of trying to make it up to him, she would prove herself, and he would have to admit she was important, that he was wrong. But then he got jealous, not of her power but her position. The apprentice of the Hokage, good at bookwork, more powerful by the day and politically in a good position, from a ninja family so neutral to shinobi clans, friends with some of the clan's heirs, and most likely supported by the non-clan shinobi and civilians in droves, but she never wanted it. Yet for that imagined possibility, he tried to kill her, and through the skin of her teeth she lived. Both teammates left, both abandoned themselves in honor and sense for nothing. She despised that. She was the only one with any sense, so she'd be the one to end them. First Sasuke then Naruto, and when she'd be done, she'd take being the Hokage from him too. Not out of spite, no. She'd take it because when she thought of it, she'd be a better one than him. Orochimaru's body lay dead, shredded. Sasuke wondered why it was so easy to kill the man. He had been withering away for years, and now he was gone. Dead. A part of him was still inside him but soon that part would be gone too. Sasuke killed him when he got the news. That Naruto had left the leaf. Well, not exactly more like he decided to kill him. Orochimaru instantly tried to take him over, but Sasuke always had a good control over himself. He understood Orochimaru more than he understood himself, but he didn't move from the bed he was sat on, Orochimaru's corpse just a bit away because he couldn't stop reading the note. Naruto Uzumaki, traitor. It defied sense. He was the one that left, the new Itachi following in his footsteps to get enough power to kill him but maybe he was the one who was wrong. He didn't want to be Itachi, he needed to know what made him tick defeat a weaker version of him before he went to the lunatic himself. And Naruto was that mini him. Sasuke thought of him as a younger version, always, maybe of Shisui but definitely Itachi. Sasuke initially wanted to steer him away from the same evil, and power Itachi had but the power Naruto seemingly gained overnight, and the power Orochimaru was corrupting him with made him renege on that. He was the only one that could, and would kill Itachi, and that was all that mattered. But Naruto was Itachi, wasn't he? A traitor trying to kill Sakura, just like Itachi killed everyone he swore to love. A prodigy, because he had become stronger, Orochimaru's reports said, too strong for it to match up with the previous version of him. And most of all, he had lied. Wore a mask, must have, his skill increase, and personality change evident. So to beat Itachi, all he needed was to beat Naruto. He would need to get stronger though. Find the bastard too. Everyone in the elemental nations wanted him, dead or alive. He was no different, and if he matched up to his expectations, he would be harder to find that Itachi. Doesn't matter really, never did. Sasuke would find him, and in their rematch, he wouldn't miss his heart. The black-haired 16-year-old smiled, eyes bright red telling of his bloodlust, dark shadow on his face reflecting on the dark in his heart. He wanted, 
so badly to kill Naruto. They really were like brothers. October the 3rd. His birthday. He had learned so much, about himself, about the world. He had parents, but they were gone and his father had sacrificed him. He learned strength, but that it didn't matter, didn't get him any closer to becoming Hokage. He found he was worthy of love, but not enough for Tamari to chase him, to run after him. He would come back for her, he knew. He didn't know when though. He needed to be strong, stronger than Tsunade, stronger than anyone else. And when he gets to that level, he would change the world. He would run right back to the leaf and take it in a moment. Because, if anything, he was Naruto Uzumaki, and he would never give up. And in the end, he wouldn't. He would learn more about the nature around it, even its chakra. He would learn about the beast inside him, about the power the gates held back. He would even learn what he had been born with, Sasuke with a twin power too. And he would earn them both, and become a god with them. That was his future, unbeknownst to him, as he removed a hand from the rock he had been resting from, revealing grass rapidly growing underneath. He didn't notice it, as he began to move once again. He had no plan for where he would go, but travel he would. Pursuit. Three years later, over his long Anbu career, same had learned the virtue of patience. That crawling waiting feeling, looking at the same house for hours on end, just in case something unexpected happens, the fearful moments of waiting for a patrol to pass overhead when you are nursing a wounded ally in the thin cover of mud and leaves. He understood the point of waiting, of not surrendering yourself to frustration. Yet every step of this mission had strained it. Everywhere the target went, there were more questions. When he crossed a border, they had to ask if they could cross it with him, when a path diverged they had to ask which one he picked, and when they caught him, they had to ask wherever it was a clone or not. He knew Uzumaki Naruto was, as always, a troublemaker. Three years had passed and his squad leader, Inu, was furious. Not the open kind, smashing chairs and casting jutsus like he had heard with tales of the fury of Uchiha Madara or worse, Orochimaru, but a cold searing hate, anger running through every inch of him. Same wondered if when you touched his bare skin, even for a second, you would feel a minute portion of that emotion. It was with these thoughts the masked man entered the tent, trepidation running all throughout. He had been patient enough. Same. Do you have anything to report? No sir. The same intel as before, traps everywhere but no sig. Then leave. I need to be alone with my thoughts. There it was again. The refusal, the needing to think of his massive plan to catch the boy when he didn't know a single thing. Same couldn't take it anymore. Enough. I know you hate the boy. I know you think you can destroy him all by yourself, but you are being a bad leader. We need command, someone to tell us where to go and how to do it, and I am just not good enough to do it by myself. We need someone with your expertise, your experience." Inu simply turned. Same knew who he really was, everyone in Anbu did, when you saw the eye at least. Hotake Kakashi, a legend, but one with his own problems, his own closet full of demons. I took this mission, same, because I wanted to own up to my mistake. I clearly cannot lead a squad, gods know my last one was a mistake. Perhaps it would be better if we found a replacement. No sir. We respect you, and you're one of the best ninja we have ever had, never failing a mission in Anbu. I know you can lead us, you just need to try. You can't let your previous team ruin. He seemed to fly across the floor, right next to same, moving without making a sound. He didn't lay a finger on him, but the killing intent radiating was enough to make the man freeze. Hmm. Maybe you are right. Same. I can lead you. What I have always failed with, is considering people to be on the same level as me. It makes me miss things, ignore things others would spot. I need you all to be to my standards, so if you can do that, do what I say, then soon we will find the Jinjiriki. The use of that euphemism for his former student did not go unnoticed by the shark masked on Boo. We'll do anything, sir. Good. First things first, stop tracking the boy. What? They are all clones. He is too good at subterfuge to be spotted roaming randomly. Go to the towns, in disguises, and try to check with the locals. Ask them who has been doing odd jobs, about stolen goods and new arrivals and when they left. How will that let us find him? How are you sure that's where he went? Then Inu looked right at him, Sharingan red and spinning almost answering itself. Because it is what I would have done, a bar at night seemed to take to ninjas like flies to a corpse. There were many ninja without a village, bandits who figured out chakra, parts of clans that were exiled or left, or even the infamous missing nin, and all coalesced into these small, boisterous, noisy placed, filled with drink and drunkards, so packed you'd find it hard to get around sober, let alone smashed so hard you'd have forgotten your own name. There were many reasons a ninja might come here, drink, sex, information. Most came for all three, 
but Uzumaki Naruto was here for a girl who caught his eye. Not in that way mind you, no. He recognized her. Her garb, her face. He dyed his hair every week or so. Not only did the roots fall away but he wanted to leave a different impression everywhere he went. His hair was longer now, he hoped making him less recognizable. To add to that, he wore a red scarf most places, to cover his whiskers when he didn't trust a hench to not get detected. It had ended up fooling a lot of the hunter and sent after his retreating self, so it must have some effect. His clone still looked like his 15-year-old self, just aged a bit, still two inches shorter, blonde and short-haired. Every time he looked at the clone, at the black and white photo he got taken with Tamari as a memento, he wondered how one could change so much in just three years. In both ways, from 12 years old to 15, and from 15 to 18. To keep up to date he found a bingo book every month, seeing his own younger face in there, as well as the celebrities of every major country. Since he was in Lightning Country, it was no wonder he managed to spot her. She was disguised of course, but he had gotten better at sensing, and could feel the pit of flame, licking and biting from her lungs. Yugi Doni, the second tailed beast's Jinjiriki. He didn't know as much about sealing as Jiraiya would have wanted him to, but that placement didn't track for him. His was on his stomach, next to his chakra source. It made sense to have it there, made it easier for the entire lot of chakra to enter his system. Putting it under the lungs meant not only would it be harder to heal the lungs were they ever damaged, it would be harder to use the beast's power without finding it hard to breath. Her lungs would contract from the foreign chakra, and she would be in a lot of pain, and have a time limit. He assumed Lightning Country Seal Masters were just idiots, like most people. He would have left her alone a week ago when he spotted her, but despite her three hench changes, she didn't do anything, didn't move to another location or meet with an informant, or wipe out a camp or anything. It looked like she had left for no reason. She wasn't a missing nin, that much was clear. The town they were in was fairly close to Cloud, so it wasn't as if she was running away, but she wasn't going back either. Over the past three years, hiding, thinking, pondering, drinking, he had thought on going back. To fighting against those that wronged him, that insulted him. To go back to Tamari. He missed her, missed her touch. Most of all though, he lacked a purpose. So, to defeat that lack of purpose, he let his inhibitions go, searched for power and meals, and sometimes lust. And now, he was curious. Why send a heavy hitter like her to here? Was it a trap, a test? Then, almost like a switch had been flipped, two distinct chakra signatures popped into his senses. One was dark, ambient, as if the person had died and been filled from the inside out with a huge pit of nothing the other felt like five different persons in one, different chakra natures all. An amalgamation. Two abominations then. He brought out his book, flipped to the S rank section, and checked the tab marked Missing Nin. The monsters in his book were Sorcery of the Red Sands, Kisame the Shark, and Kakuzu, who Naruto nicknamed the Bastard. Nobody else, who could have that large a chakra signature stood out. Well that, and some random named Hidon who seemed to have been given the S rank recently because of some bullshit rumor he was immortal. Naruto dismissed a claim like that. Only gods and demons held that power. Naruto knew one was Kakuzu, but the other was an obvious. Sasori seemed to fit, but he didn't have anything unique about his chakra. He was deep in his thoughts, but he still noticed the Kunoichi being handed a letter. She got up quickly, rushing out the front. Naruto would have pursued, but decided to nurse his sake a little longer. His senses expanded far, far enough for her to be in his range all the way until she impacted them. He felt calm. The calmest he had ever been in his life. Akatsuki was right next to him, and all he had to do was attack, and he knew they would be dead. He rose out of his seat, left a tip with a flick of a coin, and ran out the same door Yugita left through, his cloak flying with the wind as he sprinted off, the rush of compressed air passing his ears like a swarm of birds. The town was small, mainly wooden shacks balanced off the side of a great big rock shard, mountain tilted and erupting from the endless green and brown valleys of the land below. The assumed Akatsuki members were traveling up the winding path up the shard spiraling round and round. He decided to cut his time in half, leaping off the first edge he could find, falling down like a missile, flinging his black cloak off his body to lose drag. When he got closer to that sinister beacon, right as the two tails Jinjiriki's chakra flared, the battle starting, he slowed his descent with a blanket of wind chakra, pulling his body up, slowing it down more and more until he was falling like a feather. He could see them now, the little specks, one with an esoteric scythe, the other, tendrils flowing from his body, fighting a blue flame. The blonde turned brunette charged up chakra in his hand, the energy flowing in a spiral, rushing wind through it too, more and more power concentrating before he launched it down, the raw centurican plummeting, 
hitting Kakuzu with a massive blast. Naruto touched down safely, the waning blue blast leaving a crater filled with smoke, the wisps crawling up the leg of the missing nin's gray-haired companion, and being displaced as Yugito escaped from view. He looked at the 18-year-old with fury. Hey, what gives you asshole? What right do you have to come in and ruin our battle? Naruto rose to his full height, facing the deranged cultist. What's your name? The immortal squinted his eyes, skeptical. Regardless, he answered. Hidan. Ah, not Sasori then. Guess I was wrong. Frustration reaching its peak Hidan sprinted at him, swinging his scythe right at the Jinjiriki. All he would need was a single strike, and he would win. Naruto rose his arm, Hidan's blade hit it, and broke. The end rotated in the air twice before landing sticking into the ground. The Jinjiriki opened his eyes, and they were bluer, more focused. Around them were markings, red, powerful. What the fuck? The immortal asked, before having his face picked up, then slammed into the ground with an insane strength, his skull crunching, spilling his brain matter into the rock behind, spiderweb fractures pouring out meters away from the impact. Uzumaki Naruto was a sage. And he could feel everything. Crushed. Naruto thought the gray-haired fool was dead after that strike and laying in the ground for a solid minute, but he kipped up almost immediately, head still drooping, a flood of blood falling out the back of his skull. Swasarin's denier the man slurred, eyelids falling as he struggled to stay on his feet. Bit by bit, he found his footing, until finally he was able to open his eyes fully, seeing a pair of sandals about to hit his face. He pushed his arms in front of his face, trying to limit the impact, but they only broke, crushed under the pressure of the blow, breaking his nose. The onslaught didn't stop though. Naruto flipping midair before closing in, five hits impacting the sides of Hidon's ribs, breaking and bludgeoning them, his organs getting crushed with each incredible impact, Naruto finishing with a haymaker smashing into his opponent's skull once more, flipping him in an unconsensual cartwheel. Hidon fell to his knees, the strength of Naruto far too much to take. He just needed more time, to regenerate, he thought to himself. The time didn't come though, exchanged for a Rasengan to the face. Weird, Naruto thought in regards to the man's durability. He had a much bigger concern though, rising out of the pit. The body rising and writhing with pain was naked, his clothes wiped out in the blast, markings and cuts marring his stone body. The man's face mask was gone, replaced with a hateful expression, and long flowing hair over unnatural eyes. And who would you be? Not telling. If the man's expression was destructive before, it was murderous now, as he charged up each of his hearts remaining, lightning and fire and wind and water, all poised at the unrecognized Jinjiriki. He failed to see the clones Naruto had spawned above though, one launched like a projectile with a spinning Rasen shuriken ramming it into the wind heart. Kakuzu flinched from the explosion, which happened to disrupt the other flying hearts, turning back to Naruto and getting a fist to his cheek. The old man was good enough to come back after that, stopping his momentum by skidding across the dirt, launching swipe after swipe at Naruto all missing as the younger man swerved and dodged under and over limb and tendril alike. Kakuzu pushed on, using the tendrils he stuck into the ground from above as a slingshot, pulling himself through the air right at Naruto. The Jinjiriki spawned a cushion of clones, halting the missing nin, slamming axe kick into a slowed body, but it spiraled away into a cloud of black tendrils, writhing in the air. From behind, the older ninja swiped a horizontal kick, which Naruto bent under, his body falling into a handstand as he twisted, spinning into a kick across Kakuzu's face, sending him reeling. He rushed closer, hoping to engage in CQC once again, but his opponent instead fired a great ball of flame at him, followed by a barrage of jutsus from his remaining elements, explosion and attack both sipping past Naruto as he ducked and weaved between each and every one. Naruto looked at the attacks coming his way understanding bit by bit their movements more and more, until he saw an opening, dashing through. Kakuzu smiled, the man falling for his trap, flame erupting from the earth leaving not a charred body, but only smoke. At the last moment, Naruto had swapped with a clone, his real self flying at the missing nin with a mid-air spinning kick. It hit on target, and he followed up, lifting the stunned man into the air, then slamming him back down with a Rasengan in his chest, the projectile pushing the man through layer after layer of rock, drilling into his sternum. Despite coughing up blood, the S-rank bounty hunter still sent tendrils out to from the ravine he had been drilled through, aiming to carve Naruto to pieces. Sensing two attacks, from both ends, Naruto flipped, a sharp black growth carving Hidan to pieces as he attacked from behind. Then Hidan, head decapitated, spoke. You idiot. You're supposed to hit him not me. Naruto landed, realizing. He was immortal then, Naruto realized. He needed to finish this quick, these two were far too durable to be taken out by normal means. 
He decided to use his trump card against them now, deal with two birds in one move. He flipped through hand sign after sign, coalescing chakra, water and earth and nature all together, the power building up. Then, he slammed his hands down, a resounding thud accompanying the rapid pouring of energy into the dirt around him. For a moment, not even a minute portion of a second, nothing happened. Then, the next, roots ripped through the ground, piercing heat on skull, picking it up and rising it into the air, before more and more roots twisted around and round, the twirl of brown wood, strong and thick yet natural rotating around the cultist's head, encasing it more and more, like an anaconda, until it was closed off from the outside world. All that was left, all the evidence of Hedon's existence, was a tree, brown, its verdant leaves already blooming. D that's impossible. The first Hokaye's technique. How do you how can you? Naruto breathed to himself, the markings still around his face. I just can. I just figured it out, by myself. Even when I was young, I felt this connection to nature. I just needed to get closer to myself, to this feeling of peace, of calmness. It isn't on the level of the first Hokage, but it doesn't need to be to scare you, doesn't it? Kakuzu, now healed enough to cower from his foe, from that fear, scambling away on all fours before sprinting away, as if a demon was on his tail. It didn't matter to Naruto, him raising his hand, and seeing two pieces of wood pierce the man's legs, constraining him to the earth. He continued crawling, as the wood took over more and more of his bottom half. Kakuzu knew he couldn't win, knew that demon, that god in the form had outlived his body, was here to kill him, to destroy him just like back then. Every tree a foe, every piece of ground a mine. He needed to get away. And all Naruto needed to do was flick his wrists, as the Razen shurikens his clones generated in both of his palms were thrown, both slamming into the now former missing Nin, a massive and chaotic explosion turning his cells, modified by a forbidden jutsu to ribbons in an instant. The only things remaining of the two notorious missing Nin, was a tree, and a crater. Now, Naruto thought, to find the Jinjuriki, Yugita rushed past rock after rock, while running as she continued her decent. Her midsection was bleeding, a large cut across, creating a searing pain. She was lucky that cultist didn't poison it. Her healing would repair it soon, but the internal damage was a little more serious. If it hit a kidney or her liver she would be in trouble. Those complex organs took longer. Those two were unnatural, impossible. She had blown them both away multiple times and yet they just pushed past. She just had to get to B even if it would compromise Kumo bringing them that close she didn't care. She needed to beat them, and only would the eight-tailed Jinjuriki be able to bring them down. Then just in front, a figure landed. She recognized him as the same one that had attacked the two, practically saving her. Had he already beaten them? The second-tailed Jinjuriki I presume? He knew who she was. Or suspected. Yugito knew then he had a proximity to the tailed beasts, recognizing herself from her Nibi's fire, the unique chakra signature recognized. Either that, or he was hunting her. Who are you? A question with a question. Leave it unanswered and put him on the back foot. The man walked closer. It doesn't matter. What matters is what you suspect or at least what you will tell your superiors about me. Yugito was exhausted. Her beast was completely drained, she had been told, and her own chakra was running dry. She couldn't deal with another fight, least of all from someone who defeated 2s ranked ninja in minutes. I won't say anything, I swear. He smirked, sinister, knowing. You will. Which is why I need to do this to you. Then shards of rock pierced her legs from below, dropping Yugito to her knees and making her scream in pain. Naruto sent a clone forward who lifted her up by her battle-loosened hair. By the time you reach your village, or a patrol, I will already be gone. Let them know how strong I am. Let them know how easily I could have killed you. Then he let go, the clone dissipated, and when the smoke cleared, he was gone. Yugito suspected the man was important, and this wasn't just to defeat those missing men. This was to send a message. Huffing under the pain she felt, she crawled bit by bit down the mountain. Reports came later that a man, Tall and brown-haired and strong had killed the s rank missing Nins Kakuzu and Hidon, and that information shouldn't have mattered to them, but Kakashi pointed it out. Pointed out the perfect shape of the craters, of the targets, Akatsuki, and most damning of all, that the brown-haired man had never been seen before. Kakashi told his squad they were probably a Jinjuriki, probably strong, and putting both of those together, he was either the three, four, five, six or nine-tailed Jinjuriki. He liked those odds, weirdly enough. He told his squad to search for men that height, that build, the aliases he uses, the patterns he exhibits. And himself? Collected all of the information into one coherent pile and day after day tried to connect the dots. Steadily, he was putting it together, 
and he didn't know what to think of what picture he was making. Uzumaki Naruto was on the move. He enjoyed the cool and calm waters of the flowing rivers he mediated next to. The feel was nice, yes, but the knowledge it was cold seemed to quench himself somehow. All of the nature around him made him feel powerful. When he gained that power, wood style, he thought if he was somehow a relative, or if he was a similar person, or 100 other things that barely mattered. All that was important really was that he had the style of the first Hokage, and that gave him some strength. He would use it, like everything else, to become the leader of the leaf. And then, finally, he would get the respect he deserved. Any who wronged him would have to cower at his feet, crying and apologizing, and weak in front of them where he was so long ago. He would prove every single one of them wrong. And whoever got in his way, he would deal with. He wouldn't kill indiscriminately, but he would have to fight those who wanted him dead. If he needed to, he wouldn't shy away. He made a promise, so himself, to his friends, that he would never give up on his goals, and even six years later, he still hadn't. Yet Naruto couldn't have known, that the two S-ranked missing nin were only the start. Riptide. Naruto was blonde again. His dyed hair changed by a hair manipulation Jutsu Jiraiya had taught him. The thought of his old master was like black ash on his tongue. He wished the man would have understood his actions, but he was Konoha through and through. No matter how he described it, the man would never trust him again. Always, he would talk of him in the same breath as he did with Orochimaru, and wasn't a terrible feeling enough? No, the world said, cutting him from the toads, from that first real step into power he had given him. Jiraiya wasn't the best teacher, but still, he meant a lot to him, taught him all he could. For all he wasn't, all he couldn't be, he was at least that to him. Another one he cared for gone. He was holed up in an abandoned countryside home, rotting wooden walls and moss-covered paint. Nothing here was worth much, except the shade. He had to flee lightning after his encounter with Ni. She was strong, but less so than him. It was encouraging, to say the least, that he was able to take out two S ranks like that, without a single scratch on his body. Addicting was one word he would use to describe that feeling, of domination, of power over someone else, the ability to decide between their life and their death and to take it anyway. Soon, he thought, he would start his homebound revolution. He had spent enough time running, enough time training. He needed a single breakthrough of impossible strength more, and he would be unstoppable. That was his win, his journey's end. He sat in a lotus position once more, and reached into the depths of his mind. He pulled his body from calm, serene water. In front, like always was darkness. Yet, the beast's eyes were smaller, lower. He sprung a line from his hand, metaphysical and bright, blue and cool, sending it forward into the cell so he could see what he had accomplished. A sharp smile grew on his sharper face, as it revealed a snarling, orange fox, the Kubi no Kitsune, but smaller, the size of a mere horse, ill-fitting his once apocalyptic nature. Come to gloat, human? It said, hatred and fury mere words, not doing the depths of his antagonism credit. Yes, in fact, I have. A few weeks, maybe, and you will be reduced to nothing. I, Uzumaki Naruto, will have done what no other man can destroyed the nine-tailed beast. It snarled. You are pitiful. You thirst for power for no gain, destroy only for your ego. You betrayed every single one of your friends, who will never consider you theirs again. You spat on your idiot father's legacy yet continued with it like a hypocrite. You thirst for power yet claim you have it, lust for other women despite your desert-dwelling lover, and the worst of it? You think in all of this you are the good guy, the hero. You are nothing, Naruto. Barely even human yet far below even a level of my weakest siblings. Not in power, but in self. The smile had been replaced with a bored expression. You done yet? It scoffed. Don't try to deceive me. I am in your mind, I know all you think. I know those words struck a chord, as you say. You believe them, believe me. Why did you betray your Tamari's trust? The Jinjuriki's face turned to hate. I didn't. She. I love her, but she isn't here. I can't love what isn't there. I can't betray it either. You think she betrayed you? No, I. I wanted her to come, to follow me. But she didn't. And I can't know she will be there when I come back. I can't sacrifice everything for her when I don't even know if she loves me anymore. A deep laugh rang out behind the bars. There it is. Pitiful, like I said, but you will earn no pity from me. Then another laugh, from the man this time. Well remember QBI, I won't give you any pity either, he said, a sadistic smile on his face as a tori slammed down through the beast's spine, eliciting a pained and anguished roar. Take that as a lesson, beast. I am your master now. The roaring grew even louder, as Naruto walked out of his own mind. Same was right. Despite Kakashi's ego and self-loathing, he was a good commander. 
they had managed to reach the second Jinjuriki following a number of discussions held in shinobi towing bars and trade road gossip leading them after some scarfed brunette. He changed appearances but the general shape stayed the same. And always, he strayed away from them, from Konoha's hunter Nin. Day after day they compared his movements to that of the pursuit, and it was almost eerie how he moved around them perfectly each time. Kakashi bet if he asked when they had caught the clone, it would line up with the exact day he moved. It was a lead, and only that of course, but it was more solid than anything else they had gotten over the last three years. It led them to Ni, who one of his onbu overheard talking about the man who had saved her. How he had spiky hair and blue eyes, and tanned skin, used a spiraling ball as a jutsu, and was strong as hell. He was taller, sure, but Kakashi expected that. The clones were as short as his 15-year-old self, it made sense he would grow in that time. They followed even more, faster and further, until the entire squad was searching for the suspected Uzumaki. They still went covered though, cloth and disguises and casual clothing, except him. He hadn't taken off that mask since starting his hunt three years ago. He hadn't stopped training either. Kakashi knew the thought was cruel, but he was going to stab Naruto in the heart with a Chidori, and this time it wouldn't miss. Naruto was meditating. The leaves were blowing, the air was flowing, rivers running. He knew all of it. Sometimes, the feeling was enough to make him cry. These days, he knew the planet was living. The leaves were its hair, the air its breath, rivers its veins. It had chakra, even. He had never known anything not living to have chakra. Even seals, as unmoving as they were, were living shifting thinking beings. How many dead had rested on the earth of this great living thing? How mountainous and horrifying was it every thought, every guilt-filled cry of anguish mistook for an earthquake? Naruto thought, how terrifying it would be to be a planet, to be that massive, to see battles taking place on your skin. The world that is you destroyed bit by bit by its inhabitants. But then, Naruto thought, if you were that powerful, why would you care? About the death, about the pain, about anyone but yourself. Power, Naruto realized, was everything. He shifted his head to the side, avoiding a sword by seconds, perfectly. A clone spawned behind him, snapping the Anbu's neck with one movement, taking the blade, and launching it at his partner. Naruto himself body flickered into the air, launching three wind blades, killing three foes before smashing into another, rolling both over, taking out a kunai, then stabbing it into his heart. The man shifted into a log though, as the substituted man fell onto Naruto from above, the sword piercing through, but only revealing smoke, as his body was cut to ribbons, the jinjuriki mid-air, form hidden by the midday sun. There were still fifty left, his senses told him. He spawned one clone for each, Den, himself rushing through the ground using earth chakra closer and closer to the strongest men. As he thought, they had a sensor, noticing him traveling towards them. One of them tried to skewer him with spikes, surrounding his body with chakra, but Naruto was more powerful, rushing much more chakra right back through the pathway, blowing his arms to pieces. Then, he burst from the ground, looking for the least surprised one. A blonde, with a hawk mask, which he killed in a single moment, effortlessly by thrusting his hand through her chest. The next went down by a single kick, the next thrown into another both killed with a fireball. It was almost too easy to dodge an overhead and bury a Rasengan into the man's stomach. Man after woman, death after death, it was effortless. Too easy. Was this all it took for him to slaughter so many of his former allies? He was snapped out of that thought by a number of his clones popping, soon after another, though with no apparent cause. Maybe he had made a mistake. He didn't order them to dispel, so why did they? More and more popped, until soon there were none left, and a single signature rapidly arrived. Naruto spawned yet more clones in preparation, until he felt space distort somehow, pulling him rapidly in. Panicking, he switched with a clone, who he dispelled soon after, the void in space ending soon after. That was enough to distract him though, as an Anbu slammed his lightning-covered kunai right into his chest. It didn't dig deep enough to kill though, the markings around Naruto's eyes telling of his transition into sage mode, making his body too durable to cut by any normal means, reducing the ray carry into a small stab. Still. Naruto's hand went up, stopping it. He looked at the Anbu, his gloved hand still trying to force the blade into his body, and saw that hair, the type he would recognize anywhere. Kakashi? The masked man looked up, then dodged back, pulling the blood-splattered kunai from his body. It hurt a little, and blood still leaked out the body, steam flowing out as the wound repaired itself slowly. Traitor. Killer. You do not get to call me by that name. Naruto scoffed. Really? You come after me? Not Sasuke. The real traitor? One backstabbing student at a time. The wound had nearly closed, Kakashi noticed. 
Naruto still stared right at him. I never stabbed anyone in the back, just defended myself. I needed what was mine, can't you see that? Forgive me if I am blinded by your attempted murder of your teammate. Naruto laughed, sadistic almost. And what about Sakura, huh? Oh, the student that stayed? She is doing quite well for herself, on track to becoming the best Kunoichi in the village. I guess she has you to thank for that. The Jinjiriki sighed. You know, I never wanted it to come to this. All I wanted was what I was owed. That position was mine the moment my father put the nine tails inside me, the moment the village hated me. The damn moment you lied and failed me time and time again. Kakashi stood up straight, shook his head. That is true. I failed you Naruto. I let you become this thing, this monster. So, let me make up for it, he said, charging up at Chidori. Naruto, still angry, snarled, charging a Rasengan. They ran at each other, smashing their attacks into one another. Piercing lightning crackled, spiraling ball grinded. The medley of chakra-infused destruction built up more and more pressure, until it exploded. Blacker and bluer, twin pairs of legs skidded apart from each other, both men rolling back away from the explosion they had just caused. Kakashi mentally berated himself. He wouldn't win against Naruto using brute force, Lord knows he has enough of it. He was an Anbu. He had to think like one. He was already drained from using his Kamui earlier, but he hit him. Those markings, that feeling, it was like the sage mode Minato had tapped into a few months before his death. Sage mode. Naruto himself was stoic, thinking. Kakashi expected him to attack head on, probably had a million get out of jail free cards and a million ways to punish him for trying. The difference between him and the Anbu though, was durability. He only needed one hit, one attack to land, and it would be over. In a rapid burst of speed, Naruto body flickered forward. Kakashi responded, setting the pace of the battle by launching a fan of shuriken. Like he thought, Naruto dodged with another body flicker, so he responded with shuriken after shuriken, each missing. His reflexes were too trained by years of combating his own clones for Kakashi's to hit. When he was close, the sage preemptively slammed his hands into the floor, a barrier of wind coming up just as the Kakashi he saw exploded into a lightning-natured explosion. It was, like what he expected of the Anbu, a trap. The blue sharp acres reflected of the wall uselessly, but soon the ground beneath started crumbling like sand, Naruto backflipping to avoid an uppercutting Chidori from the real ninja. Mid-air for the barest instant, he landed, and was now on the defensive, blow after blow smashing into his guard, the Sharingan wielder managing to dodge around with an impossible agility, Naruto's blocks uselessly predictable due to the precognitive gift he swore to end the Jinjiriki with. Smartening up, disadvantage apparent, Naruto took a kick to the face, barely moving or noticing it, his sage mode empowering his defense. He took advantage of his opponent overextending, charging up a wind blade in his hand. It exploded outward in a circular arc, slicing through Kakashi's body clean, though he exploded again, another clone, lightning seizing Naruto's body as the real Kakashi dove from above, yet another Chidori charged, poised to kill. His mind scrambling and his immobile body, the younger man spawned a clone, his copy pushing him out of the way and taking the hit, allowing the original to. Having recovered, smash a knee into Kakashi's stomach, grab onto his lightning-infused arm, and toss him over his shoulder whilst calling him a one-trick pony. Kakashi ignored the taunt, using Naruto's extreme momentum and strength against him, throwing him into the ground, with a resounding thud, eliciting a wheeze, before smashing a fist into a sage-marked face. The Anbu tried for more, but was punished by an unseen kick to the stomach, sending him flying backwards into a standing roll. Naruto charged in, fury evident. Unleashing a flurry of hooks Kakashi dodged around in a dancing rhythm. The boy tried to roundhouse kick him from below, but he caught it with both hands, tackling the blonde and smashing him into the ground again. Rolling over his body, turning around and kicking him in the ribs as he rose. It connected, but Naruto caught it, swinging the Anbu into the floor, his body hitting it hard, then launching a wind ball at him, forcing the man to summon a wall of rock. The two jutsus clashed, the pressurized air exploding into nothing, but... It was destroyed by a Rasengan moments later, the Kakashi behind taking the hit, but being revealed to be nothing but a clone around a wooden log. The real Kakashi slashed Naruto's neck, yet it was another clone, a barrage of kunai flying at the masked man from behind where the clone had been, right where Naruto was when he launched the wind ball. The Sharingan user pushed them away with a lightning-fast electric shockwave, blitzing out from his fingertips, kicking up yet more chakra-infused dust. He played into Naruto's hand though as his Sharingan couldn't see through the high concentration of chakra, obscuring even Naruto's signature. Silence stayed for a few seconds, before the smoke cleared, and Naruto was nowhere to be seen. Then, 
From above, Kakashi heard a swirling shriek, as the clone user threw a Rasen shuriken right at his former sensei. Said man's borrowed eye bled, sealing the attack away with the rapid use of tactically applied Kamue. Hand gripping his bloodshot eye, he exclaimed in shock, a completed Rasengan? He recovered quickly, launching three kunai at the airborne enemy, each thrown at different speeds, impacting one another during their paths, until one made its way into his enemy's neck, coated with lightning, nicking against it but not piercing it, a small splash of blood shooting out. Angered at his wound, Naruto spawned a clone to slingshot him down at Kakashi, his copy's large powerful arms sending him down like a bolt from a crossbow. The Anba fought back by launching tripwire kunai, a string attached to two parallel kunai set to explode via an explosive note, poised to force him to move. However, Naruto didn't stop, pushing the blades out of the way with a light gust of wind, spawning another clone, slingshotting again to the left, then throwing another clone at Kakashi himself. The masked nin dodged its drop kick handily, smashing down, killing it with a single lethal blow. Then, he was face to face with three opponents, breathing heavily. He had used up a lot of his chakra, and Naruto only had a few wounds. His plan of forcing Naruto into close quarters wasn't working out and he would outlast him if Kakashi had to counter Jutsu with Jutsu. He had one Reikiri left, and probably one Chidori left. He would need every single bit of himself to win. Getting tired senpai? Me, I'm only getting started, Naruto said, a vicious smile on his face. Kakashi calmed himself, standing straight. I barred this technique from a former teammate. I think he would be honored that I use it to kill you he said, his eyes shifting, showing under the mask he was smiling too. Naruto looked in confusion right as his sage mode ran out, and Kakashi disappeared, knowing for a while Naruto was on the edge of returning back to normality, the Sharingan showing Naruto's naturally green glow fading. The next moment after Kakashi vanished, one of Naruto's clones were cut through, from stomach to rib. The next had his eye pierced, a single attack, a single death. It was only years of training and reflexes that allowed him to catch the kunai aimed at his heart, the blade slicing against his fingers. Remembering before when he had been caught at the start of the battle, Kakashi let go, smashing a spinning kick into the Jinjuriki's head, then battering him with strike after strike. He jumped up, kicked the Jinjuriki in the head, then mid-flip looked away from Naruto to his pouch, taking out two shuriken and launching them into the man's legs, before landing deftly. Then, in a split second he charged lightning into his kunai for yet another Reikiri, hate and anger and betrayal powering it, his body launching forward with arcs of electricity and an insane speed, arms ramming his kunai into Naruto, and missing. The Jinjuriki dodging at the last second, the blade going through the gap in his arm. Naruto smirked, and stabbed into the Anbu with his own kunai, blood spilling from his ribs and choked cry falling from his covered mouth. Then he looked up eyes wide, seeing another Kakashi, moments away from hitting him, Chidori in hand. The clone ripped through the real Kakashi, going through the other side and hitting Naruto through his chest. Blood ripped through both men, the hand through the other side covered in slick scarlet life. He had one. Kakashi had killed Naruto. Then he popped. The clone of Naruto popped. In that small moment where Kakashi flipped over, taking his eyes away, Naruto spawned a copy, hiding behind it perfectly. Lying in wait for the shinobi's gambit, waiting for him to take the bait. The smoke cleared, and the already near-dead Kakashi saw the Jinjuriki smash a Rasengan into his heart. He had failed. Everyone. Always. He had even failed the boy. Minato's child, his brother not in blood but in truth. He could relate to him so much, understand him, but no. He was too busy trying to kill himself. Too busy trying to follow his father to take care of someone. That was the ugly truth. Everything that had happened to Naruto, everything he had become, was his fault. And here he was, trying to kill himself all over again. He really was pathetic. Well, he was dead. Dying. Same thing. He had always been on the edge, really, ever since his father died. Since then. He was barely there, always tethered to something, someone. Minato, Yamato, Naruto. Now it was all gone. Now he could be in peace. In hell. No, a person like him didn't need an afterlife. All he needed was the worms. He died screaming, blood flushing out as his chest was caved in by the bright blue death ball, pushed further and further in, the man showing no mercy. None at all. Enough to make a man cry. Squad 1 is dead. Tsunade looked up from her papers. Her eyes were wide. A daunting feeling plummeted from her chest, all the way down to the bottom of her gut, the feeling swirling and sickening, all of them, every last one. She swallowed a gulp of spit. It tasted like ash, somehow. She needed a drink. At least she knew that would taste as bitter as it always did. Dragon, leave. As you command, 
said the Anbu commander, who had taken it upon himself to deliver the news personally. He body flickered out of the room, leaving nothing but space. She reached under her desk, fishing out a bottle of sake in a cup. She poured a shot out, lukewarm liquid falling dead, before just leaving it there. Sat, like her, on that desk, despondent. Kakashi was dead. There really was no hope for Naruto then, the entire squad. Not just the captain, everyone. They had lost contact days ago, and now they knew he didn't even care to leave any survivors. For what? Power? Was that what Nawaki would have become if that explosion hadn't happened when he was the same child that Naruto was? She shook her head. She was the problem, she the one at fault really. She projected her love and grief onto Naruto as a way to deal with the lingering feelings all these years later. The Tsunade of then would have become Hokage for her little brother in an instant, but then he left, and all she had was the hat. And what did that make her? She sends children into battlefields. Let's mentors go on suicide missions to kill their students. Hell, she even let Naruto escape in the first place. Why was she even here anymore? She didn't care, she didn't want this. She wanted to gamble her life away, run from debt callers and ninja hunters, feel nothing, drag everyone down with her until she died six feet under. She looked at a picture of her, Shizun, and Sakura, all smiling. Tsunade scoffed, because she knew now. She was better than that. Just a little longer. Just a little longer and she could leave them, and die by her lonesome. It was what she deserved really. What was going to end her story? Just a little more, there we are Sakura, one miso ramen, I hope you enjoy it. It hurt coming back here, now more than ever. She wondered if she was the problem sometimes. The Sakura of then, pink haired and starry emerald eyed, was so weak, so cowardly that never in her pink head full of pining and jealous thoughts could she have made the team stick together. First Sasuke, driven by revenge. Then Naruto, driven by hate. And finally, Kakashi, driven by duty. He didn't even say bye, and three years later all she hears is his death. Gone, forever. All of them were. Sasuke is now corrupted by Orochimaru, even if those reports of his death are true. They have heard nothing about him, except his crimes and murders. Him only getting by because of Naruto's heat distracting them. And the blonde, gone because of her. Everyone tries to tell her otherwise, that he did it to himself, that he wanted to leave ever since Sasuke did, but she knew better, knew she didn't even want to talk to him after what he said to her that day in the hospital, and she regrets it. Only a single drop more, it could have been, of love and care and attention that he needed, but she couldn't spare it. And to what end? Maybe he was right, all those years ago. Maybe she was cruel. Her ramen was cold. She left it on the table. Those memories were meant to make her feel warm inside, but it just made her empty. Steadily, they were getting ahead of her, but she had something they didn't. Friends. She rushed off to another session of practice with Tsunade. Lateness wasn't tolerated. Couldn't be, sitting on a simple rock, in a simple forest, under a simple clear blue sky, Naruto didn't know what to think. Kakashi was dead, his teacher, the one who told him about his parentage, the man who saved his life. He didn't regret it but he didn't feel much about it. He realized, it didn't matter to him anymore, the abandonment. He had let it go. No longer did that hellish trauma burrow deep inside him. He wanted to be Hokage, but in a way as if he had never been born in the leaf. Power, respect, love, fear. He needed that, needed to breath it. To be it, he didn't care about Kakashi anymore. But there was still the leaf, still Tamari. Some part of him, questioning and doubting like always, barked out that nobody wanted him as Hokage, that they didn't deserve him, that he should just settle down in Suna with Tamari instead, and he guessed that was the cold calculating voice of reason, but yet again he ignored it. He couldn't let go, because it was his. Because if he leaves and joins Suna and everything else, then they won. Day after day, week after week he was feared, unwanted, seen but not heard and treated with no respect. After, if he gave up, they would still think that way, still think he was a coward, a fool. A monster. But why does he care in the first place? Simple. He wants to prove them wrong. Wants to look them in the eye and see them surprised, wants to win against them. He doesn't care if they want him or not, he doesn't care about their admiration. All he needs is to be better, stronger than they ever thought he could be. That's exactly what he wants. That was why Kakashi was dead. He stood in his way. Gray hair falling in bare strands because his hatred for himself obscured his consideration of his own life blood flowing from open chest, he chose to use Naruto to kill himself. It was rather sad, Naruto thought. He stood up from his perch, and continued on his return. He wanted to see Garaa, see Tamari. Soon, they would meet, and soon they would march on Leaf. 
only a couple of weeks more, and he would break the nine tails, and then, he would be unstoppable. Itachi was woken from his slumber, body failing bit by bit, by the brisk sound of nothing. He didn't dream often, when he did, they were horrors of the past. Not being able to catch Shisui, him falling forever and ever. Killing countless enemies until he realized they were wearing Sasuke's dead face, the stolen skin drooping off in a cruel mockery of his brother. Sometimes it was just a copy himself, crying, looking scared and vulnerable, wanting nothing more than to survive. Every time he had that dream, he killed it, an emotionless kunai to the neck. He sighed, rising in a single, accurate, precise, perfect movement, live body flexing and shifting under his fishnet mesh shirt. Him and Kisame set up their camp near the coast. It was beautiful, he could admit, even through his half-blind clouded eyes, but the moist air did no favors to his lungs. Step after step he moved over the ground, bare pebbles and flakes of the ground sticking to his new sandals. They did a lot of traveling, him and the shark, wearing their clothes down bit by bit. The Itachi of before wouldn't have even consider him a friend, but somehow, now he was his closest ally. They were both monsters, but they had a shared understanding in that predatory existence. Keep the blood flowing, and they were alive. Itachi once would have said he hated the killing, but that was a lie. He wanted peace, and so whenever he killed one who professed the opposite, he felt happiness. Well, until that night, so many years ago, yet far too close still. Still he regrets that, he thinks, walking up near the edge of the continent. He regrets making that mistake, leaving Sasuke to the vultures, killing all he knew because he was too weak to do the hard option. Find a way to let everyone live, and he couldn't. In his small 12-year-old genius mind, he had to kill them all. And now he paid the price, apart from them all, and in a dying body. It was horrible and ironic, that the only way to repair it, to have any good come from his mistakes, was to scar his younger brother with his death, and hope that would be enough to let him unlock his mongekyo. As it was, he was worthless. Yet still, Kisame grinned every time he saw him, like he did just now his back to the shining rising sun, a letter in his hand. Hey, Bruder. Got a letter for you, he said, smile sharp as ever, figuratively and literally. He threw it, the paper sailing softly in the morning breeze until it landed in Itachi's hand gently. The Uchiha read it, calm, yet a small quiver in his voice. He swallowed, then talked. Hotake Kakashi is dead. You knew him? Yes, he was my squad leader in Anbu. You sad about it? Itachi's eyes were as cold as ever. Distant like he was looking at someone else entirely. No. It is a shame to lose such a strong shinobi, but the person that beat him must be stronger. As it happens, Naruto was our target last that I heard. Kisame started laughing deep. Ha! You want to fight this kid? Itachi, for once in so long, smiled. After I fight my brother. I hope he is as resilient as the Jinjiriki has shown himself to be. The town is burning. He can smell it, he can see it, feel the terror. He is covered in blood, from weaklings and nothing more. He is powerful, he is a god to these people. And it isn't enough. Sasuke was still behind him. Behind that blonde haired himbo or whatever, the fool able to kill his former sensei. Some cynical, overly so, part of him thinks Kakashi wanted to die, simply sat down whilst Naruto slit his throat, but that doesn't strike him as what the ninja would do. He was given a mission, kill or capture Naruto, and he failed. Simple. He was weaker, but Sasuke wasn't. Soon, he would run into him. He knew where the Anbu died, knew what the new Naruto looked like using the power of his Sharingan and some interrogation gene jutsus on an unwitting witness a couple towns back. It was only a matter of time, of days. Then they would meet, and Sasuke would kill one brother, and be one step closer to killing the next. Sasuke wondered if everyone close to him was fated to die. Kakashi, Naruto, Itachi. The only exception was Sakura, but she wasn't ever close to him, was she? Just a one-minded obsession. He looked at the flames in front of him, knowing, feeling, that he was obsessed too. Brothers. Scarf pulled high, clothes hanging off his muscled body, the Jinjiriki walked into yet another bar, ordered yet another drink, and yet again, took in his chaotic, atmospheric surroundings. Despite the repetition he felt from these much too familiar actions, he had been forced to abstain from his usual shinobi bar visits ever since his battle with Kakashi. The hunter squads quickly disbanded, scattered like crazy, and from then he was simply traveling across the armpit of a region which was the land of hot springs. It had been wrought with economic turmoil from the wars previous until it rebranded itself as a home for the rich and wealthy of the surrounding lands, ending up as a sort of caste state, the poor working for little pay serving the upper class in every way they could. And that meant every way. Waiters, chefs, 
prostitutes. Despite that feeling of prosperity and harmlessness, every village he came across was destroyed. Burnt to the ground, dead civilians sliced and stabbed and executed. If he didn't know better, he'd have thought a war was going on, but here he was, in a bar full of missing nin and mercs, and not a single one was talking about deployment, about scavenging battlefields and killing high bounty targets like he'd have thought. Either he was right behind a major offensive so destructive and hidden people had yet to hear about it, or it was a group, small, maybe even one man. His first thought was Akatsuki, but they seemed to be making a move on Jinjiriki, not world domination or whatever. Senseless slaughter didn't seem to be their aim. The blonde was stumped, so out of concern and curiosity he ventured into the first place he could find, in the aim of figuring out what the fuck was happening. A large burly man sat next to him, smelling of alcohol and body odor. He must have been 8 feet tall, and almost 500 pounds, but he still somehow sat on the small chair, the wood creaking under his weight, just barely holding on. He looked at Naruto's drink, clasping an unwelcome hand on his shoulder. Juice? What are ya? A pussy? Drink some real manly shit like. He was cut off by a kunai ripping through his neck. Then the bar exploded. Naruto, of course having better reaction speeds than near everyone in that shithole of a place managed to escape by diving out of a window seconds before a riptide of lightning cracked down with an insane pressure and power, vaporizing anything in sight, destroying the roof, walls, crashing every window in a 50 meter radius, and crushing the foundations. He rolled up to a stand, turning around, scanning to see the perpetrator. And then he saw a man, standing, a chakra-infused hand aimed to the heavens. Black raven escape hair. Pale skin. Soft features. And, of course, two red eyes copy wheel spinning insanely. Right at him, Sasuke. The Jinjiriki said, shock, and memories building up in a matter of moments. The brooding boy turned man turned his hand, waving, a venomous smile placed on his mouth, eerily reminiscent of his former master. Before you attack me, let's talk, shall we? If either of us win I'm sure we'd want to know what the other did since we last met. It took every bit of will Naruto still had to not smash his foe, the traitor, right in the fucking face. One breath, two breaths. He nodded. All right. Explain. It was you who destroyed those villages right? Sasuke smiled wider somehow. He looked deranged, unsettling. Like instead of the brooder he was before, everything had come unfurled, and he wasn't confined by any idea of being an avenger or a ninja. Hair darker, body lither, eyes wider, everything about him was more, too much even. His outfit was a medley of black and blends of purple and charcoal, bare traces of blue. Trailing falling cloth tinged with red amongst the sea of night, draped over tight, body fit clothing, so close to his skin you could see the tight muscle underneath. Yes. You want to know why, I am guessing? Simple, to get to you, I needed to attract you, make myself a threat you couldn't ignore. I used to not care about the fucking fool Ginger Ikinaru Uzumaki, Hell Orochimaru needed to force me to learn about you. Said I needed to know your weaknesses in case I ever came back and needed to face you. Of course, then you left. 15 years old and you followed in my footsteps. Naruto scowled. It wasn't like that. The Avenger laughed, mean and cruel and maniacal. Too loud and too long. No, it was worse. You attacked your teammate because you were jealous. Because she was a threat to you. Naruto went to object, but he couldn't. He stayed silent, frustration building. I understand it. Really, I do. You never cared about her, just the idea of her. And when that idea of a perfect world was gone, you saw no use for her, cut her away. Just like him. Confusion welled up inside Naruto right next to his anger. Him, Itachi. Just like him, you lied, said we were your friends, were the most important people in the world to you, and then when you saw no use for us, you cut us apart. I wondered which version of you was lying, but then I realized just like him everything about you was a lie. You say you care about your friends, but you have none. You say you want to create peace, but every conflict you are in you create war. Everything you have ever done is a contradiction, is a falsehood. Sasuke looked right at the Jinjiriki with every word he spoke. He savored the sanguine taste of Naruto's reactions, the delight on every response he gave. He was worse than Itachi, worse, so he could play with him. A worse liar, so he could poke holes through him and watch his breath leave his body until it left him dead. The sage shook his head. No, never. I am nothing like him. I chose to never abandon my friends. Yet here you are, alone. I would never slaughter an entire clan. I know what you did to that hunter nin squad. I never lied. I would never lie about what I am. You are different. Too different. Naruto knew Sasuke was trying to get to him, trying to put him off, but part of him accepted what the Uchiha was saying. How? Sasuke laughed a bit, lunacy reaching almost a peak. 
The Naruto of old would have never attacked Sakura, never had left the village, never had left his loved ones, never had killed indiscriminately. Yet, here you are. The only reality where that makes any sense is one where that Naruto was never real. A ploy, to make us closer to you, so you could manipulate, use us, and get whatever you needed from us. Sakura, she might have been useless, but she had at least some potential, and as much as I don't like to admit it, she was important to me once. And me? Sasuke Uchiha, strong, young, and a Sharingan wielder. The worst outcome, if I was close enough, would be to steal my eyes and run away. Bearing his teeth, Naruto's frustration nearly reached a peak. I would never. I cared for you too, both, but then I realized you weren't worth it. You hated me, abused me, used me, and I got nothing from it. Sakura attacked me, you nearly killed me. Look at you. Do you truly believe that lie? We were friends, we cared for each other. We weren't perfect, but still we would have died for each other. It was a broken relationship. But you and Sakura could have been together still, even without me. Why do you think of me as a villain, Sasuke? His smile turned from a happy one to a sad one, then dropped altogether. Because you remind me of him. Reminded me of Itachi when he was younger, though dumber. I thought that meant I could ensure you'd stay good, but it was folly. He was never good, like you were never good. Both liars, even to yourself. Even if you hadn't attacked Sakura, hadn't left the leaf, had stayed your old happy self, it would have been a lie, just like Itachi's brother loving self. Lies so deep they override everything. Lies so strong they seem like truth even to you, but what you don't realize, is that in reality, you two are soulless. You both held on to those falsehoods until they became inconvenient, and then you threw them away for others. Say what you want about me, Naruto. I have always remained truthful to myself. I hate Itachi. I want him dead, not because he hurt me, but because he is a pathetic waste of humanity, who should be called from the world. And you? You are the exact fucking same. I let you live, not only do I not get my practice on the prototype of the Itachi variant of scum, but I also let a waste of breath, vacant soul and self, loose on the world again. The blonde looked to the side, letting out a laugh, not of humor, but exasperation and rage, expelling both in an effort to keep it together without breaking. And you are the arbiter of goodness? Destroying village after village in an effort to find me? Sasuke smiled again, tutting. Never said I was a good man. Just that I would kill a worse one. He unsheathed his tanto from the fasten on his back. Naruto breathed. Slowed it. Calmed himself, collected every single bit of hate and rage, and tried to let it go, but he couldn't. He decided it didn't matter, to collect the nature chakra anyway. It would take time though. Time, he noticed as Sasuke sprinted towards him fast, he didn't have. The Uchiha, running low, uppercut with an upward swipe of his sword, Naruto flipping back to avoid the attack, somersaulting and launching a fan of kunai at his attacker, forcing a deflection, granting the Uzumaki enough space to spawn a few clones, all four of his bodies rushing at Sasuke. The first threw a too obvious punch, Sasuke slicing his jugular with a well-placed slice, the second rushing through the smoke but too slow as it was stabbed through. Naruto rushed from the side, body flicker enhancing his speed, a Rasengan formed in his hand, aiming to ram it into the raven hair's ribs. In a moment though, the Uchiha generated a spark of lightning in his hand, pointing it at Naruto's heart, and firing an arc, blasting through and making a huge hole. Then he popped. The real Naruto burst through the second clone's smoke, spinning mid-air and smashing a kick into the side of Sasuke's head, hard enough to make him roll. Both landed on their feet. The lightning user flashing a couple of air emanating strikes at Naruto almost instantly, his body barely swerving around all seven of the strikes in quick succession. Then the dust settled, and both men stared at one another. One, blonde, Uzumaki, who felt like he never truly had anyone, owned anything fighting hard to get whatever he could. And the other, brunette, Uchiha, who had lost everyone, who was nothing and knew it, and wanted to end everything with nothing left, wanted to return everything to where it was. They ran at each other once again. That's the end guys if you enjoyed then make sure to leave a comment this is Chaos Shinobi signing off.